Okay. Um, there's uh, about two minutes to going on air, which will be from that transceiver. And hello to those who are looking in on um, the webcam. Yeah, Is the audio okay, Terry? Yeah, well, I'm clear. Thank you. Oh, good, 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 good. Okay. Um, I'm not transmitting the, the Q channel this time. I wondered who the one was that's looking in. Now there are three looking in, I believe. Uh, 9.29. Okay. In a few seconds. Your um, Facebook put out an alert earlier in the night, Chris. Oh, okay. Whatever that means. Okay. And it, and it automatically started it. Okay. About 30 seconds. Hello to Dennis, the avid YouTube watcher. And just waiting for it to tick over to 9.30. Oh, hello, Vega. Anyway, we're going live. Hello, this is VK3, Alpha Mike Lima, with the regular Saturday night uh, transmission. And hopefully this works. Okay. Um, this is VK3, Alpha Mike Lima. And uh, we've had a lot of trouble with um, splitting audio for... Uh, the transmitter, the two meter transmitter down here for those who are watching on YouTube Live. And uh, last week we did the whole program on the Q channel so that there was no control over switching the mic on and off. So I hope I didn't say anything uh, <laughs> untoward. And hello, Terry. I can see on the YouTube Live uh, text box that Dennis from Bega and uh, Terry from FTJS from um, Hoppers Crossing is, is watching. Picture so far looks okay. Um, we've brought it up this time via Firefox rather than Chrome, so we hope it doesn't disintegrate in terms of picture quality as time goes on. Tonight, uh, the principal topic I'll be covering uh, because of the discovery of a number of suitable clips for this session, uh, will be astronomy. And I don't intend to cut into uh, uh, Clint, um, Clint uh, down in Warrigal's territory on this, but I do have quite a few um, audio clips going back to the 1920s dealing with the development of cosmology virtually from the start of it. And so we come to our first person in the extraordinary astronomers list. Um, Henrietta and Henrietta oh, All of my Q channels are going crazy. Henrietta Swan Levitt and uh, the cosmologist Joe Dunkley will tell you more about her. So this is to start our evening of uh, astronomy and talking about astronomers and the discoveries that have led to our present understanding of the universe. I'm Jo Dunkley, and I'm here to tell you about amazing women astronomers who, in the late 19th and 20th centuries, faced down challenges many of us would recognise today. Despite the obstacles, they each managed to change the way we understand the universe. Astronomer Henrietta Swan Levitt joined Harvard College Observatory in 1895. She was part of an extraordinary group of women known as the Harvard Computers. Their job was to classify stars using photographic images. 
As women, they weren't allowed to operate the telescopes themselves and were paid very little. Levitt studied stars that get brighter and dimmer over time. She discovered a pattern in 1908, now known as Levitt's Law, which says that a star that takes longer to pulse is intrinsically brighter than a star that pulses quickly. This means that just by measuring the rate of pulsing, which might be days or weeks, and by seeing how bright the star appears from Earth, an astronomer can find out how far away it is. This was transformational. Edwin Hubble used Levitt's discovery in the 1920s to work out that smudges of light in the sky were in fact entire galaxies far beyond our own. The universe was much bigger than we thought. I have such admiration for Levitt because she was assigned very mundane tasks in her job, yet still made this And there's the first mistake of the night. <laughs> um, Henrietta Swan Levitt, who found a relationship between the pulsations of variable stars and their distance, which allowed later cosmologists to work out that the Milky Way is actually uh, a lot uh, smaller a part of the universe than they thought. There was a time when... Um, Astronomers thought that galaxies were part of our Milky Way, that they were just star clusters. And it was only at the turn of last century that people like uh, Henrietta Swan Levitt worked it out. The next cosmologist I'd like to talk about is Harlow Shapley, who took on Levitt's work and extended it into measuring um, the sun's position within the Milky Way. This is back about the time of the First World War. And uh, he originally was trained as a journalist, took on a course in astronomy because it was a convenient course to take in his particular uh, institution of learning. I'll just read out a bit from Wikipedia. He realised that the Milky Way galaxy was far larger than previously believed and that the Sun's place in the galaxy was in a nondescript location. This discovery supports the Copernican principle, according to which the Earth is not at the centre of our solar system, our galaxy or our universe. Shapley participated in the great debate with Heber Curtis on the nature of Nebulian galaxies and the size of the universe. The debate took place on the 26th of April 1920 in the Hall of the United States National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C. Shapley took the side that spiral nebulae, what are now called galaxies, are inside our Milky Way, while Curtis took the side that the spiral nebulae are island universes far outside our own Milky Way and comparable in size and nature to our own Milky Way. This issue and debate were the start of extragalactic astronomy and the detailed arguments and data, often with amb ambiguities, appeared together in 1921. However, uh, Shapley did popularise astronomy greatly in the first third of the 20th century and uh, we have him to thank for measuring the size of the Milky Way. Shapley is the earliest astronomy, astronomer of, of which I have a recording, a recording made when uh, the movie tone newsreel was just starting in December 1928. He was attending a conference in New York. The audio quality of this newsreel is really exceptional. So here is the oldest recording I've been able to find of an astronomer talking about his work. Harlow Shapley, recorded New York, 28th of December, 1928. Among the thousands of scientists who are meeting in New York are the astronomers, those scientific peoples whose interests are the stars or the studies of the heavenly bodies. Dozens and thousands of other stellar systems, each containing millions and millions of stars. Among those other systems, we find clouds 
of galaxies. And the most remote, those described at the present meeting in New York, are something like 10 million light years away. That is, the light coming from those objects have been en route. The waves of light come across space for longer time than man has been on the surface of the Earth. And all of this work in astronomy is not for material gain or not for the personal comforts of man, not at all. It is merely to satisfy man's longing to know about this universe in which he plays a transient and trivial part to help the spiritual side of man's existence. Harlow Shapley, December 1928. Through that period, there were um, the construction of several major optical telescopes. Radio astronomy at that stage in the 20s was virtually unknown. Karl Jansky had not yet built or detected extraterrestrial radiation at that time. But uh, they did build on Mount Wilson in Southern California a telescope with a 100-inch mirror which helped them to extend their optical reach, particularly in, in association with time exposures on, uh, on optical, on uh, photographic film. And uh, I'll play a bit of a documentary on astronomy and on Mount Wilson, dating from 1933. So this is moving on five years from our last clip to something of the state of astronomy in 1933. A specially constructed toll road winding up the mountain and providing the visitor with increasingly impressive views of the surrounding country finally brings one to the observatory situated on the summit of Mount Wilson, more than a mile above sea level in the clear, brilliant air of Southern California. Because of the favorable climatic conditions and the wealth and variety of its equipment, Mount Wilson has become the center of astronomical research in America. An isolated mountaintop, remote from the petty affairs of this earth, where men spend their lives studying the mysteries of stellar space. The solar observatory with its 150-foot tower telescope is used exclusively for photographing the sun, and important solar research has been carried on here. Let us see what sunspots look like, those curious phenomena about which we hear and read so much. The round object illustrates the comparative size of the Earth. This is a spectroscopic photograph of a solar prominence which is an immense flame-like protuberance which frequently dashes out of the surface above the sunspots to a height of 150,000 miles. They might be likened to cyclones of flame. Here we see the giant 100-inch Hooker reflector, the world's largest telescope. The difficult task of casting the glass disk weighing... The grinding and testing of the huge mirror was carried out in Pasadena by the observatory's opticians. The mirror rests at the bottom of the telescope tube. As the rotation of the Earth would soon take the instrument off any star or planet being photographed, a delicate clockwork keeps the huge 100-ton telescope in perfect time with the Earth's movement. To overcome the tremendous friction due to the great weight of the instrument, the main bearings are hollow steel cylinders floating in tanks of mercury. Let us look through this amazing telescope at Saturn, with its rings of meteoric dust composed of particles about the size of small pebbles. The planet and its rings are cool and shine by the reflected light of the sun 886 million miles away. Here is a photograph of the constellation of Auriga of which Capella is the leading star, about 19 light years distant from us. Note as the exposure has been lengthened how stars of 15th, 18th, and even 20th magnitude become visible. Stars of the 20th magnitude are invisible to the eye even through the largest telescope, but the more sensitive photographic plate records them after several hours' exposure. This is a spiral nebula in Canis Venatici, a million light years away. So huge it takes 10 million years to make one revolution. Our Milky Way, though older and more diffuse, is also a spiral nebula, and from Canis Venatici would appear much as this. And here we see our nearest neighbor, the moon, as it appears through the great telescope. Popular belief to the contrary, it is highly improbable that man will ever be able to bodily explore stellar space. But by the aid of this amazing telescope and greater ones to follow, it is reasonable to believe that we are on the verge of great visual voyages of discovery to the very ends of the universe. 1933, the state of astronomy, optical astronomy. And uh, I'll say hello to Dennis in Canberra. Dennis VK1DKO. Uh, to, uh, let's see, John Young. I'm not quite sure where John Young is. Terry Sims, of course, in Hoppers Crossing. 
and there are a couple of others I see on the stream already. If you want to look in on this, not that you'll be seeing much, um, but if you're having trouble with the radio, the uh, two metre coverage, try uh, Googling VK3AML 3 April 2021. That is figure 3 April 2021, VK3AML 3 April 2021. And you should be able to find the live stream of, uh, of this uh, uh, two metre transmission. You're listening to VK3 Alpha Mike Lima on 147 475, the regular Saturday night transmission. Moving forward now to the 1960s, uh, there are a couple of cosmologists by that stage, uh, Margaret and Geoffrey Burbage. They were Brits working in America who were uh, working on various aspects of cosmology. Uh, their main contribution to astro astronomy um, was in terms of determining the origins of all of the matter in the universe, with the exception of hydrogen and helium, which are prominent in large quantities in stars. Uh, they determined that the uh, the higher elements, the elements with a greater number of electrons, neutrons and all the rest of it, up from hydrogen and helium were produced in the cores of stars, which would then uh, go supernova and, uh, uh, you know, explode and the material would go out into space and then eventually form an accretion disk around a star, which would form planets with a greater variety of um, material. And I see that my live status is flickering on and off for some strange reason. Um, hello to John Young in Alban Vale, wherever that might be, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, here are Margaret and Geoffrey Burbage, very much the happy married couple in 1963, talking about the way their work in astronomy dovetails in with their normal married life. Dr. Burbage, why did you come to America? Well, the, the telescopes, first and foremost. There are, there are uh, these beautiful telescopes here. The one that we uh, worked with first of all was uh, the McDonald Telescope, 82-inch telescope in southwest Texas. And then uh, we did some work at Mount Wilson. And most recently, we've been working at Lick Observatory, where there is a very fine new telescope, 120-inch. It's a beautiful instrument. It, uh, the observations I get with that, I, I just, uh, it makes me wish that I'd had access to this for very much longer. It's a wonderful telescope. Um, then we have here uh, at Kitt Peak, we have the new telescope and the, um, the 84 inch telescope. And then there is a still bigger telescope, 150 inch, that's uh, underway. It's all these things, all these uh, observational facilities. But more than that, I think it's the climate of, of not the, the weather climate only, but the the, the interest in astronomy, the fact that you can talk to other people who have exciting new ideas in your own field, you can, you can um, exchange ideas. You're not working in a vacuum so much as you are in, uh, in England. I feel as if we're on the edge of nowhere. I also feel yes. the telescope looking out into nowhere. How far can it see? Well, that's an awkward question, because astronomers don't like to measure distances in miles. It's much easier to... You think of distances in terms of the time taken for light to travel from any uh, any object in the sky to to us. Uh, well, I don't know. How far would you say? Oh, perhaps 500 million light years or a thousand million light years, or perhaps even further, depending on what kind of observations one is trying to to make. Can yes. we just can we just clear up this point about 500 million light years? The distance uh, that light would travel in a time of 500 million years. So that anything you see coming from a star 500 million light years away is 500 million years ago. That's right, that's right. So we belong on Earth, which goes around the sun, which is a yes. one in millions of suns in the Milky Way, and then there are millions of galaxies beyond the Milky Way. Yes, that's right. Now, how does this space shot program fit into this? How does this Sputniks, the, the space travelling, how far are they going to be able to go out into this space? Oh, not really outside the solar system, I should think. And you as an astronomer, how do you feel about all the money that's being spent on this sort of thing? 
I think we get rather angry when we think of the money that's being spent on these sort of things and what we could do in um, ground-based astronomy by putting, building up, uh, putting new telescopes in the southern hemisphere, for instance, telescopes of the size of the 200-inch telescope in California. Uh, we could do this for a, a fraction of the money that's uh, contemplated in these sort of things and problem of putting a man on the moon and so on. What sort of questions would you answer then if you had these telescopes? Questions of the life study, the life history of, of galaxies, the stellar evolution, the, the, the how, st how stars form, what happens to them after they've formed out of the gas and dust in our, in our galaxy, um, how they build the chemical elements in their interiors and how these get mixed back into our galaxy and, and uh, form the building material for later generations of stars. Uh, the kind of things that are going on in the very central regions of other galaxies than our own. I think these are, these are some of the exciting things that, that we'd like to do with more telescopes. What are the ideas on this at the moment? What are your ideas on it? How do stars start? Well, maybe uh, question well, of star formation. <laughs> well, uh, how stars are actually condensed out of the interstellar gas and dust, the material between the stars, is still not very clear. Uh, some very fundamental work was done by Sir James Jeans uh, in 1900. And in some respects, uh, we have not advanced too much in our theoretical knowledge. Uh, that is, it's very easy to prove theoretically that stars can never form. Uh, but, uh, of course, we know that they did form. Uh, perhaps a very large number of stars formed in the early history of our galaxy. And we also know, quite uh, by very good arguments, that stars are forming continuously. That is, we, we are able to determine the ages of some stars, and we know, for example, that some of the brightest stars that we uh, can see, and some of the most massive, some of the heaviest stars that we know, can only be something of the order of uh, one or two million years old. The, the general arguments show that stars, that some stars are as old as 10,000 million years in our own galaxy. We don't really know anything about the ages of stars in other galaxies. But this means that, uh, that we have established that star formation has been going on continuously from a period perhaps some 10,000 million years ago, right up until uh, the last million or so years, which in astronomical terminology means now. Of course, this raises some of the fundamental questions of cosmology as distinct from astronomy. I mean, when you talk about things forming in space, stars starting, you raise questions as to what starts them and why and how it all began. Yes. Well, one can, of course, put it this way. On the other hand, one can take a more limited view and say that one is discussing the history of our own galaxy. And if one wants to relate the early stages in the history of our own galaxy, to the early stages in the history of the universe, if one believes in such an evolutionary uh, cosmology, an expanding universe expanding in a, in a big bang, or from, a, from a, an essentially a, a point source, uh, then perhaps it is of cosmological interest. But we're not sure of this, because it's also entirely possible that new galaxies are forming even now. And so to, to date the history of a galaxy, the age of a galaxy from the time, uh, from the beginning of creation in some evolutionary cosmology, is really not... Uh, necessarily correct. Dr. Margaret, would he be trying to avoid my question? <laughs> I, maybe he is, because I think, I think we're all, we all are interested in, in co the cosmological problem, or whatever you like to call it. Um, we can't help, it, it, it ties in with our philosophies and so on, and, and we can't help wondering about it, even if our observations uh, don't get very far towards settling anything. Oh, when he uses the word creation, he starts a whole train of thinking. That's right, yes. <laughs> the, the doctor's Burbage and Burbage wouldn't be trying to avoid using the word God, perhaps, would they? They, they talk about <laughs> creation, they talk about a beginning, but we never get back to the fundamental problem as to how did it start. Do you believe it possible that it started without some act of creation? Uh, well, I just feel... I, I don't like to tie myself to any particular belief. I just feel agnostic about this, that um, um, I believe in a spiritual s side of the universe, but I don't believe in any in formal theologies or, or anything like that. <coughs> Dr. Burbage looks very cynical on this. <laughs> well, it's you who call this a fundamental question, you see. 
Well, when you introduce the word creation, you raise the question. No, no, it's the connotation that you put on the word creation. I think that, uh, that it's really... Well, important. creation suggests a creator, I don't know. I think it presumes Isn't a creator, but uh, perhaps not, Dr. Burbage, can you... No, it, it presumes that there was some kind of an act, but one is not. Now, uh, for example, continuous creation. In, in, in continuous creation, what is being talked about here is the appearance of matter to replace the matter which is expanded away. And until we, until we have a, a, some kind of a physical idea of this process, I don't think we, we can attach too much importance to the, to the whole theory from this point of view. Now, you talk about the act of creation uh, in an expanding universe which started uh, with a big bang. Well, here again, one goes back to conditions. Or one is forced back to conditions under which the properties of the fundamental particles and the properties of the nuclear uh, the nuclear properties of the system become very important. And so I, I, I don't want just to sweep this all up, this tremendous amount of, of physics which we don't understand into the one word creation and then immediately say God, because that, that to me is the easy way out. And you've got a little girl? Yes, uh, yes, she's six and a half now. She's you um, introduced the idea of God to her? Yes. That's and, interesting. Uh, <laughs> well, I think you, you have to. You have to. Uh, children that age can understand philosophical problems. You have to try and make things simple and uh, uh, introduce the harder concepts, I think, as, 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 they, as they want to know about them. What's the most exciting thing that's happened to you since you started working in astronomy? Well, I think the most exciting time was when we were working in, in theoretical work on the origin of the elements. But... But uh, a number of separate exciting things that I, I can't think of one now, but, but the excitement of after you've worked one bitter cold night, but uh, a number of separate exciting things that I, I can't think of one now, but, but the excitement of after you've worked one bitter cold night, uh, a whole long night, um, eight hours or so observing on, on one object, and then you finally develop the plate and you find some something you didn't expect there, some, some new thing, or you, you've actually brought up something on the plate that you were hoping for vaguely but didn't know whether you'd get it. Well, that, that's a wonderful moment. Margaret Burbage, cosmologist, recorded in 1963, talking about the origin of elements. She was one of the originators of the idea that uh, elements other than hydrogen and helium were derived in the cores of stars by nuclear fusion another fairly revolutionary finding. Moving on now to the 70s and a very young undergraduate astronomical researcher named Jocelyn Bell Burnell. It's interesting that a lot of the major thinkers and movers and shakers are Burnell. But even with our largest telescopes, how would you search for such a tiny object just seven miles across at a distance of 10,000 million million miles. The neutron star was regarded as a mythical beast of no interest to practical astronomers who had better things to do with their time and their telescopes. So what was to be the crucial discovery at first had nothing to do with either neutron stars or the crab. At the Mullard Radio Observatory in Cambridge in 1967, the new instrument was perhaps the least glamorous telescope ever built. It looked like four and a half acres of washing line. It was created for an investigation into certain special galaxies that are far across the universe. For this, it had to be extremely sensitive, so they simply covered a field with radio aerials. In fact, more than 2,000 of them. The array could not be moved to track a star. It simply rotated with the Earth scanning continuously night and day across the sky. And it was to be operated full-time by one person, a girl. The graduates built it, Jocelyn Bell. We were actually using this telescope to look for quasars because they twinkle. And this thing's specially designed to pick out twinkling things. And after we'd been running, I suppose, about a few months, I began to notice there was something slightly curious on the records. They came out as paper charts. And, of course, on these charts you could see radio sources and, unfortunately, you could also see man-made interference. But there was also something that didn't quite fit either bill. It wasn't exactly a twinkling radio source and it wasn't exactly interference either. 
And then we began to notice that it was coming at the same sidereal time each time. In other words, it kept pace with the stars, not with any of our man-made activities which go by the sun or by Greenwich Mean Time. The analysis of some three and a half miles of data took patience and persistence, but in the end, she satisfied herself that this was a star that ticks like a clock. It was beating time in periods of just over a second. What was the first reaction of her supervisor, Dr. Tony Hewish? It's absolute nonsense. You don't believe this at all. It must be something artificial. Uh, nothing in nature could do this, so you disbelieve it as long as you possibly can. Everybody's first reactions were that it must be man-made. Second reactions, not really voiced very loud, were, well, perhaps it's little green men, another civilization. They could produce a man-made signal. They would be close to a star, like our sun, and they'd move around with the stars. I think perhaps being younger myself, I found it quite slightly easier to believe than some of the older hands at the game. But we did really spend a lot of time with that first one trying to explain it away. We wrote round to all the astronomical observatories in sort of Britain saying, have you had any programme going which might possibly cause radio interference? Because of course the only people who keep sidereal hours, sidereal times, are astronomers. It was easier with the second one. Um, and that was a great relief in many ways because it removed this possibility of it being little green men. Highly unlikely that several lots of little green men would be all signalling to us all at the same frequency, all at the same time. Later, Jocelyn Bell wrote up her work for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Mostly her thesis is about how the aerial system works. Almost in passing, it records one of astronomy's most exciting discoveries. This was an entirely new type of star. The hunt was now on and everybody joined in. In a sort of galactic gold rush, the discoveries poured into the scientific papers. A name was invented. Pulsars. And so it went. And I see Clint Jeffries with us. Uh, Good day, Clint. Um, he tells me that he's been watching from the start with occasional audio breakup. Uh, you've had to refresh the page three times. Okay, it seems that there's quite a bit of congestion on the internet tonight. We haven't had this problem before. Um, and I'm not trying to steal any of your thunder, Clint. It's just that in the course of casting through archival resources here, I came across a lot related to astronomy and decided to uh, trot it out tonight. This, by the way, for those listening on 147 475, is VK3 AML with a regular Saturday night uh, transmission, test transmission, I suppose you'd call it, on uh, various subjects using spoken word material of various types to uh, talk about the history of science and technology as well as sound recording, ham radio, radio itself. So on to um, a discussion of the work of Edwin Hubble who perhaps is the uh, key cosmologist of the 20th century about whom the and uh, I'll give you a one-hour documentary on the 30-year uh, history of the Hubble Space Telescope. In connection with this, I have a, a sort of a personal connection with, with the Hubble, a remote one. When I was a very small child, about uh, three or four years old, in the late 50s, about the time of the Melbourne Olympics, the thing that got me into amateur radio was being babysat by a um, teenage bloke across the road who was working at RMIT as an electrical engineering student, Brian Harris, who was VK3ZFH. They had a ham radio shack with various antennas backing onto the little dead end street in which I then lived, Torring Road in East Hawthorne. Uh, and that radio shack up his backyard facing onto the street. It was a peculiar street with the back fences on one side. Um, I would be babysat in the radio shack, uh, complete with HT rails running everywhere. Perhaps they were trying to get rid of me at that early stage. Uh, but Brian Harris later became involved with Plessy Electronics in Adelaide, 
and I believe that his last major design effort was to design some of the communication equipment that went into the Hubble. Uh, Brian, I last saw in 1991. He died in 1994. Uh, at a Paris conference, actually, just dropped dead of a heart attack at the age of 56, poor chap. But uh, I have very fond memories of him, and, uh, uh, of course, it was a great way to get into electronics. Uh, watching somebody using the cast-off equipment of the major world war that just predated me um, gave me an insatiable appetite for uh, assimilating circuitry and what particularly fascinated me at that early stage were the cathode ray oscilloscope that uh, Brian used to tune up his transmitter with a trapezoid pattern as I later found out. Anyway, the Hubble Space Telescope. Here is a documentary on, uh, on that. It will run an hour, so we'll finish at about 10 past 11. And at that stage, I'll throw it open on two metres for a talkback session, hopefully a, a chat about the things that we've heard here. This is VK3 Alpha Mike Lima. I'll be interrupting this documentary at 10 minute intervals just to announce the call sign and keep it legal. And uh, thank you to the nine people that have now turned up on uh, YouTube Live. If you do want to look in on what we're doing here, uh, Google VK3 AML 3 April 2021. And you should be able to find the live stream on YouTube Live. Not that you'll see much, just a profile view of me conducting um, operations on my second computer on my right. My uh, main computer, which is streaming me, is on my left. And, uh, of course, you can see the VHF transmitter. Not that there's much to see there. But for those who need something to do on a Saturday night, I guess it's all of interest. Uh, the, the reason I'm doing the YouTube Live is not because of the visual aspect, but because at the moment with no HF outlet, I am limited in my VHF coverage to about 100 kilometres from Melbourne. So for those who are interstate, particularly those who are overseas, uh, this provides an alternative, an alternative source. The Hubble Space Telescope, a history thereof. Discovery Houston just wanted to let you know that the ground is currently configured for and a this is the main bus activation. Uh, Houston, uh, we just put the main bus power on. April the 25th, 1990. Mission Control wakes the crew of the Space Shuttle Discovery with a song written and performed by local Houston band Private Numbers. Good morning, out of space from all the human race. It's time to stow your sleeping gear. We know you had a blast. you up in space at last. Now your main objective's clear. Ignore the space telescope. The five astronauts in orbit are well prepared for the day ahead, deploying the Hubble Space Telescope. With its two and a half meter wide primary mirror and a suite of scientific instruments, Hubble will transform our view of the cosmos. There is no part of astronomy and our study of the universe that the Hubble Space Telescope hasn't fundamentally advanced. In some cases, those advances have been complete revolutions. It's been able to propagate out into the popular culture in a way I can't think of any other scientific instrument or advancement has ever done. A joint mission between NASA and the European Space Agency, Hubble will give us a new perspective on our place in the universe. It's the ultimate ego wash. You know, whenever you think that, that your problems are overwhelming or truly important, all you need to do is look at some of these images from the Hubble telescope and realize how impossibly small we are. It's, it's nice for a reset. 
I'm an astronaut and artist, and I'm recording this at my home in Florida, surrounded by some of my space memorabilia and also art inspired by space exploration. Over the next hour, we'll be exploring Hubble's profound scientific and cultural legacy as we follow the telescope's own dramatic storyline from struggle through disaster, success, and redemption. The Space Telescope, due to be launched in the 1980s, will be hoisted into orbit some 500 miles above the Earth by the Space Shuttle. Fitting into the shuttle's cargo bay, the telescope will be latched to a tilting mechanism and rotated into a 90-degree position for checkout. It will then be placed in a vertical angle, released, and its power and communication systems deployed. Good morning, Discovery. Your wake-up music today is compliments of your training team. We want you to make them proud today. Hello, uh, I'm Dr. Kathy Sullivan, oceanographer turned astronaut, first American woman to walk in space, and proud member of the shuttle crew that put the Hubble Space Telescope into orbit in 1990. This is Mission Control Houston. Our PDRS officer here in the flight control room confirms uh, via telemetry that uh, the Hubble Space Telescope has been grappled. Our game plan was Steve Hawley would operate the robotic arm, grab the telescope, lift it up, our job was position it above the cargo bay of the shuttle so that ground controllers could command antennas to unfold and solar rays and, and start checking out all the onboard electronics. Charlie Bolden would be backing up and helping Steve with the arm. Bruce McCandless and I had gotten halfway through the procedure to do a spacewalk just in case something went wrong. You got to go to release the perlers and a go to transfer Hubble to internal power on time. We were racing against the clock of draining the batteries. By design, Bruce and I had no active role in deployment because on any split second notice, we might have to disappear. So I appointed myself photographer and I had every piece of photo gear that we had clustered up by some of the windows and was just documenting everything. Mission Specialist Kathy Sullivan continues uh, to prepare for deploy operations. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, beginning to set up photographic equipment on the flight deck. Uh, to uh, document the deploy activities. You know, pitch is uh, about four degrees off, attitude-wise. Okay. Things went slower than planned, lifting it those first few feet gingerly out of the bay because it began to rock and tilt as it never had done in any of our simulations. That show us about two inches starboard. And it, it had a very, very tight fit in the shuttle cargo bay, so Steve was horrified that it was moving at all and really nervous about bumping it in the least bit. This Hubble Telescope Control Greenbelt, one day, one hour, 54 minutes, mission elapsed time, continuing to receive television through the uh, Vandenberg uh, tracking station. And uh, it is clearly showing the uh, deployment of the uh, solar array masts uh, with the uh, solar array package uh, in the stowed position. The arrays are wound uh, much like a, a pair of window shades around a, a, a roller. It was a very complicated mechanism to lower these two arms so they were sticking out of the side of the telescope and then unfurl the solar rays from the rather like a pull-down curtain. The first side went just fine, all good. The second one, the arm came down and then the curtains started to come out and they went a little bit and stopped. Houston Discovery, it looks like motion stopped with uh, just about one panel showing. And we see that too, Lauren. The DCE is off. There was a lot of head scratching and thinking and more commands from the ground. They went a little bit more and stopped. And at that point, Bruce and I dove down into the airlock and started getting suited up. This is Mission Control Houston. Flight controllers here at uh, Mission Control Center discussing an impending deadline. Uh, within about 13 minutes, we will reach a point of having concluded the pre-breathe and in order to provide enough rapid response time to support an EVA, we would need to begin depressurizing the airlock in about uh, 12 to 13 minutes from now. All the engineers responsible for Hubble on the ground are frantically scratching their heads and trying to analyze you know, what, what has happened here, why. 
So now we have two streams of activity in parallel. Kathy and Bruce, as quickly as you safely can, suit up, get in your pressure suits, get ready to dump the airlock and go outside, and you guys on the ground, you'll see if there's anything you can do to unstick this. We need to get on with it. Hey, Flight, I'll come back with the answer. I need answers now. Flight of fail. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't feel comfortable waiting until... I don't either, that's why I want the answers now. Yeah, 6.20 is the, my drop-dead time for adding up all the times. Okay, I'm going to have them press on. All right, Capcom, tell the crew we want them to press on into EVA. Just quickly, we got four minutes on this pass. Discovery used. Discovery, go ahead. Okay, with the panels that you've got out there right now, it's not satisfactory to stay overnight, so we're going to have to move out on the EVA. We got all suited up. We started to depressurize the airlock. I think we had half the air dumped out. So there are like two steps left for us. One final checklist to make sure everything's working on your suit. Tell mission control it's okay. They think for two seconds and they come back and say, right, go for EVA, dump the rest of the air off you go. We had those two steps left. And one of the engineers on the ground found a way to fix it with the software go. command. Go. So go. off go. they went, go. Go. sent the command and began to get back into sequence to let Hubble go. ERS, go flight. EVA, we're go. Sergeant, you're still go? Go. GC, go. Network, go. Payloads? Flight payloads, we are go. go. Capcom, we have a go for release. Discovery, go for Hubble release. And so the upshot of all of that is, instead of being up at the windows taking my pictures and watching Hubble as it receded away from the space shuttle Discovery, I was locked in a small tin can staring at a blank white wall when Hubble was deployed. You've been so good to me, uh, you know you make me wanna lift my head up and shout, throw my head back and shout, come on now, shout, come on now, shout, The next day's wake-up call to the space shuttle crew is little short of triumphant. The telescope was powered up and prepared for its mission of scientific discovery. The triumph would be short-lived. Good morning, Discovery. I guess you're awake after that song. Uh, there are a lot of happy people down here. who We saw a great deploy yesterday, and Hubble had a good night while you were asleep. Tell you know, better find that guy and sign him up from XQ that did the uh, wake-up music. Still on the subject of stars and outer space. The idea of building an orbiting space telescope goes back to the dawn of the space age. Here's a 1959 broadcast from Voice of America. Another group of astronomers told a recent meeting of the American Rocket Society in San Diego, California, that they are designing a satellite that will carry a bank of telescopes into an orbit 500 miles or 800 kilometers high. And just to interrupt that and keep it legal, this is VK3 Alpha Mike Lima with the usual Saturday night test transmission on 147.475. Uh, we are simulcasting this, I guess you'd call it, on YouTube live, on a live stream. Uh, if you care to look in, if you're having trouble with the, the radio transmission on 147.475, two metres, Try Googling VK3AML live, L-I-V, sorry, <laughs> VK3AML 3 April 2021. That's again, um, if you want to uh, get better audio, uh, perhaps look in on what's going on in the studio, not that you'll see much. Um, VK3AML. 3 April 2021, and that should get you uh, uh, the link for the uh, YouTube Live. And back to the recording on the history of the Hubble Space Telescope. By thus sending a telescope up above the Earth's atmosphere, they hope to pierce a blanketing ocean of air that has, for the most part, obscured man's detailed view of the universe. The Earth's atmosphere, of course, has been the great deterrent to the full effectiveness of the telescopes we have on the ground, not only because it disturbs the uh, light rays as they come in and distorts the images, but because most of the radiation from space cannot pass the atmosphere at all. 
That was, doc that was Dr. Fred Whipple, director of the Smithsonian Observatory at Cambridge, Massachusetts, discussing the launching of space telescopes. The idea of Hubble was something that was among the astronomical community for generations. It was not something that was new. Astronomers badly wanted a large telescope above the atmosphere, so that they had a chance. Hubble was a great idea. NASA's first chief of astronomy, Nancy Grace Roman, would become known as the mother of Hubble. Speaking in 2017, a year before she passed away, Nancy explained how plans for a giant space telescope began to take shape in the early 1960s, just a few months after it orbited the Earth. She knew it wasn't going to be easy. I knew how much trouble we were having trying to build a satellite to carry a six-inch telescope. So somehow or other, the idea of getting started on a nine-foot telescope didn't appeal to me. But it did appeal to the aerospace companies, and it particularly appealed to a NASA center in southern Virginia. They we had the responsibility for the manned flight program at that time. It was manned also, it wasn't human, it was manned. They had the responsibility for the manned flight program and they thought this idea of a telescope above the atmosphere where the man could ride along, look through the telescope was just the greatest thing they could think of. Of course, the problem was that the astronomers didn't want a man along at all because a man needed to grieve. We didn't want an atmosphere. That was what we were trying to get away from. And also the men would wiggle occasionally. And if you were taking a half hour exposure, I don't care how carefully he tried to keep still, he isn't going to keep still for a half hour. And every time he moved, the telescope would move. So this did not make sense to the astronomers. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. Well, I decided that if the aerospace companies were going to put a lot of money into designing a telescope, they might as well design one that made sense. So what I did was to bring together a collection of astronomers from all over the country and some NASA engineers and get them to sit down together and come up with something that the engineers thought would work and that the astronomers thought would do their job. And that was really the beginning of the serious effort on the Hubble. Stretching the mind of humankind to the very beginning and end of space and time, the space telescope may tell us at last whether the universe will expand forever or whether that expansion is slowing. The telescope was named after Edwin Hubble, the astronomer who discovered the universe was expanding, the foundation of the Big Bang Theory of cosmic creation. It may help us learn more about the violent events of the universe. Pulsars, quasars, the gravitational implosions that produce black holes. It may also tell us how the universe began and how it will end. But ultimately, as is the case with all voyages of discovery, its greatest contribution will be the unexpected breakthrough that brings completely new knowledge. But within weeks of launch, NASA scientists and engineers discovered that the one and a half billion dollar Hubble was in serious trouble. There's a significant spherical aberration appears to be present in the optics, in the, in the optical telescope system optics. At a press conference on June 27, 1990, a somber looking NASA program manager, Douglas Broom, had the job of breaking the news to the world's media. Some people asked me earlier today, what is spherical aberration? The simplest way of understanding it is that when you have a um, mirror that's focusing, the light all comes together at a single point is the objective of the exercise. You want the light to come together and focus at a single point. When you have spherical aberration, it says that there's some disfigurement of that mirror that causes the light, instead of focusing at a single point, to be spread across a region in space. And that is spherical aberration. Fiasco is a good word. The mirror's edges had been polished slightly too flat, and it was clear from this edition of the BBC's Horizon 
that the scientific community was not impressed. It's always been obvious that in anything as risky as a uh, space telescope or any space project, you can have disasters and difficulties, but uh, I don't think I ever would have believed that something could be wrong with the mirrors. And uh, they were supposed to be the most perfect mirrors ever made, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's a very sad thing because it means that most of the, of the science that uh, the wide field camera team, especially, and also the faint object camera team, most of the science that we wanted to do is not now going to be possible until some way is found to correct for the problem. I was very upset and very angry. I was uh, happened to be in bed, actually, with flu, and somebody rang me up from America. And I, I can remember getting out of bed and, and going into the bathroom and then banging my head against the door, you know, for about two minutes. I was so shocked. Since I can remember, I wanted to be an astronaut. If I'm being honest, I still want to be an astronaut. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the opportunity. Eric Whitaker, the composer of Deep Field, a 2015 work commissioned by the Minnesota Orchestra and BBC Radio 3 and inspired by Hubble. When the Hubble telescope came online in 1990, I'd been watching for years and years because they had spent billions of dollars on this thing and they had promised that it would show us images clearer and further than anything we'd ever seen before with earthbound telescopes. What a lot of people might not remember is that when it first began sending back images, they were blurry. The US Congress did what they always do, which was they called for the dissolution of NASA and NASA did what they always do, which is they rolled up their sleeves and got to work. Making an astronomical mirror is it's a complicated thing, but it's done all the time. How, how can this possibly be? The agency and the Hubble team were vilified and ridiculed everywhere you could turn about. The, the late night comics and stand-up comedians had a field day with NASA and the politicians had an extra field day. Astronaut Kathy Sullivan. You know, what I quickly realized was easy to jump on people for making a mistake. We goofed. But you will never find a human team that doesn't in some way at some time make a mistake. I don't overly judge human teams for having been human and made mistakes. If I'm going to judge a team, I'm going to look at how do they respond when it's clear, it's revealed what the mistake is. And the Hubble team was doing two things. There actually were some, some significant pieces of Hubble science that were not affected by the mirror problem, and they were carrying on with those. So Hubble wasn't broke, like dead. It was doing science, just was, couldn't do some big bits, but it was doing some very good science. And then meanwhile, the other team, instead of crying in their beer, was off figuring out how they could find a way to fix it, which of course they did in the end. So I'll happily stay on a team that goes, oh dear, my bad, now let's go fix it, let's get on with it. The periodic revisit of the shuttle will allow for the replacement of components and routine maintenance. This ability to service the telescope through human care will extend its lifespan up to 20 years. The thing with Hubble, the idea that was there from the beginning, was we need to start thinking about telescopes in space like we think about and use telescopes on mountaintops. And you're listening to VK3 AML, the regular Saturday night transmission uh, on this occasion the history of the Hubble Space Telescope is being covered. Uh, every Saturday night, 9.30pm, uh, as far as my social life will allow, um, we put on a program of uh, spoken word material related principally to science and technology and the history thereof. And tonight, as I say, astronomy and the Hubble Space Telescope where has it got us in the last 30 years since its launch? And that is being answered by this documentary. You build a big telescope with good mirrors once, and people drive up and down the mountain, and they bring a new instrument. They change the whole scientific plan. And you bring technicians, and you repair it if things break. We need to be thinking about this that way and using astronauts instead of technicians. These astronauts would need to carry out five spacewalks attaching a new instrument to correct the flawed optics. 
and upgrading instruments, electronics, and the British-built solar arrays. In December 1993, Space Shuttle Endeavour will link up with Hubble in orbit to carry out a space mission never before Nine. attempted. And we have a go for main engine start. Five, four, Hubble Space Telescope. Grab that thing. I bet you are. We were hoping you'd say that. Good morning to you. The crew of the Space Shuttle Endeavour have picked up the Hubble Space Telescope as it orbited the Earth. They'll now try to repair it in what will be one of the most complex operations ever attempted in space. At a height of 320 miles above Earth, the shuttle edged nearer to the Hubble Space Telescope. Then, as the remote control arm reached out to grab it, Mission Control waited anxiously. Endeavour has a firm handshake with Mr. Hubble's telescope. Never before had people dressed in spacesuits gone to do such fine work in, in the sense of, of precision operations. And there were, frankly, many people who didn't think it could be done. Jeff Hoffman, one of the astronauts on that first Hubble servicing mission, spoke to Quentin Cooper. We had numerous calls from people who were wondering if NASA had maybe bit off more than it could chew. And, uh, you know, I even had a call from an astronomer friend at the Space Telescope Science Institute who told me that, you know, if you guys can just get in one of those two corrective optics instruments, we'll be more a sense of, of what it's like doing these these EVAs, these extravehicular activities, Be because from the images, it, it all looks amazing and lovely, and there's the blue-green earth below you, but you've got a complicated job to do, and you can't exactly hold that screw in your teeth while you're putting something in place. No, in fact, being able to manage the myriad of tools that we have to use is, is one of the critical tasks that we spend so much time practicing underwater. We carry a couple of hundred different tools if you look at the pictures of the astronauts when they're out doing their spacewalks, they've got lots of tools dangling from their chest packs and from the uh, manipulator arm tool rack. Every single tool has to be tethered. You don't want your tools floating away, and those tethers can get tangled up. You really have to uh, give credit to the people in the Hubble project who have produced uh, so many tools specifically for Hubble operations, without those tools, we wouldn't have been able to do what we did. So, you know, this is a, a job which the astronauts are the public image that, that people see, but never forget that there's hundreds, maybe even thousands of people who had to work to make a mission like this so successful. Uh, daylight outside, so you might want to put uh, your visors down. The Hubble repair tasks on the spacewalks that were done, they're very, very, very complex. There's literally thousands of fasteners and bolts and connectors and tens of thousands of miles of wiring. Very complex circuitry. Crews now are getting their work sites set up, getting their tools in order and making sure that all the tethers are in place. So any task you know, take this box out and put a new one in. It's complicated choreography. You've got a, a pallet, a carrier that's got the new bits of stuff on it. You've got to grab Hubble out of the sky, set it on this servicing cradle, use the shuttle's robotic arm to move an astronaut around like a cherry picker. James, one of the things we've been able to enjoy watching is the uh, choreography between the uh, crew member operating the mechanical arm and the person that's out on the end of it is Kathy is here. And the sequence of steps is usually 
it's very critical you get it right. I don't know whether to cite the most elegant and complex ballet you've ever seen or the most complicated sporting play you've ever seen that had to all execute just so, but it's it's of that ilk, but on steroids to successfully do a Hubble repair spacewalk. It's not closing. The doors aren't closing right. Let's try to get the bottom. Let me get the bottom coming in. Hopefully you close that straight. Over the 11-day mission, the shuttle crew carried out five back-to-back spacewalks. Jeff Hoffman and Story Musgrave alternating with Catherine Thornton and Tom Akers. They notched up some 35 hours and 28 minutes outside the spacecraft. Astronomer and author Stuart Clark. I think one of the reasons that Hubble has become such a cultural icon is that it does feel like it's the the herald of the future in the sense that we see astronauts going to the Hubble, servicing it, making it better, keeping it going. And it's this idea of, of living and working in space that I think gives it a real feeling of humanity expanding outwards, expanding what it does, and just just kind of getting on with it. You know, we're all used to people coming to our houses to fix our appliances. And here's astronauts doing it for a space telescope. It's at one moment completely normal and in the other utterly extraordinary. And I think that inspires a kind of awe and hope for the future. I do have some good news for you, Jeff, um, and for everybody. Um, the uh, payloads folks informed me that uh, the DF and the coprocessor have gone through a complete checkout and are fully functional. Great news. Well, almost home free. We've got a basically a new telescope up there, and uh, it could be real exciting for the astronomical community, I guess, and for the whole world to see what uh, Hubble really can do with uh, a good set of eyeballs. The uh, purpose of today's uh, press conference is to present and explain the first images from the Hubble Space Telescope following last month's servicing mission. NASA's next major Hubble press conference on the 13th of January, 1994, was rather different to the previous one. So it is with tremendous pleasure and pride that I introduce to you Senator Barbara Mikulski of Maryland, chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee on VA HUD and independent agencies. I chair the subcommittee that financed uh, the manufacture of the most significant contact lens in American history, (laughs) the uh, fix on the Hubble Space Telescope, and then bankrolled this extraordinary space HMO that went out and gave Hubble Telescope a new uh, contact lens. And I'm happy to announce today that after its launch now in 1990, some of its earlier disappointments, the trouble with Hubble is over. Everybody's heard of the Hubble Space Telescope, a great reflector with a 94-inch mirror launched into a path high above the atmosphere where seeing conditions are perfect all the time. Unfortunately, it turned out to have a faulty mirror. Frankly, that was human error. But a brilliant repair mission has put it right, and now the Hubble Telescope is every bit as good as had been originally hoped. And it's sending back amazing results. And um, who better to join me than Professor Alec Boxenberg, Director of the Royal Observatory. Welcome back, Alec. I think you will agree that the Hubble telescope is a real triumph. Well, I must say it is. When it first went up and we first we saw those pictures, uh, to say that we were disappointed would be an understatement. But now it's been repaired. It's very stunningly good and everybody's so thrilled. There is no part of astronomy and our study of the universe that the Hubble Space Telescope hasn't fundamentally advanced. In some cases, those advances have been 
complete revolutions. It helped, for example, show us that the universe wasn't just expanding, but was accelerating. And it also showed us for the first time that we live in a truly evolving universe by revealing the way that galaxies have changed their shapes and grown and evolved through cosmic time. At the last count, scientists have published more than 17,000 papers based on Hubble data. But perhaps more significantly, Hubble has revealed the universe to all of us on Earth as never before. It's shown us light from the most distant stars. This is VK3 AML with the regular Saturday night test transmission. Um, I'm announcing the call sign every 10 minutes to keep this transmission legal. You're listening to a documentary on the history and operation of the Hubble Space Telescope from its launch, I think, in 1990 through to the present. Um, that was produced by NASA and um, not generally accessible on the internet unless you know where to look, which is rather obfuscated. There are immense amounts of archival resource on the internet which are hidden behind walls of multiple menus, as many of you probably know. At 11 p.m., in about 20 minutes, I'll be opening up for ham radio callbacks and chat on 147475 and I just want to thank the people that are looking in on YouTube live there's only five at the moment there have been nine in the past um, but if you uh, care to look in on us or hear audio with slightly better quality perhaps than two meters uh, Google VK3 AML 3 April 2021 VK3 AML 3 April 2021. That should bring up the YouTube live clip. Well, clip, it's been going now for nearly 90 minutes. Back to the documentary on the Hubble Space Telescope. So far away that the light we're seeing has traveled from the very dawn of time. The vividity of the images that the Hubble has took, just their sheer aesthetic value, has helped people connect with the the wider universe i think that it has made them more comfortable with the concept that we live in this amazing universe it may not have led them to understand in detail black holes or things like that but it's definitely made them feel that the universe is not a remote distant place, but something that's very close up and tangible, a physical realm rather than one that we just gaze at from afar. The piece that I composed for orchestra and chorus was inspired by the deep field image taken by the Hubble telescope. Composer Eric Whitaker. In 1995, once they got the Hubble telescope fully operational, they pointed the lens at a completely dark area of sky. That means to earthbound telescopes, there was literally nothing there. And they collected light over 11 days, I think 384 separate exposures. And when the data finally came in, it was processed. It showed in this tiny sliver of sky, 3000 objects and almost every one of them, a galaxy. Each of those tiny pinpoints of lights representing a hundred, hundreds of billions of stars. To me, it shows just categorically how impossibly large the universe is and how small we are in it. Well, I was very lucky to be at the Albert Hall and um, listen to Eric Whitaker conduct his deep field piece. And this idea of just huge time and distance and massive interconnection in that small things get together and accumulate into something much larger than the whole. And the idea is that we're moving through deep space faster than the speed of light and what we're doing is we're approaching the edge of the known universe, the, this deep field image. And you can hear in the music, it's very slow to unfold. 
and very slow to build, but that was intentional as a composer. I wanted to try to convey somehow this the scope and scale of these vast distances that we're talking about. As it opens up, we get what I call this deep field chord. It's just this spectacular musical moment. I say that with humility, not as the composer, but <laughs> more as the conductor now. So I've had the chance to conduct my own music several times, this piece. And it's really difficult to describe what it feels like to stand on the podium. And it's so loud that the podium itself rumbles. I can feel it in my feet. And it's, I've done a couple performances, this is with a live orchestra, where the sound coming off the stage is actually moving uh, my tuxedo jacket. I can feel the wind moving so much that uh, that is just a, an incredible feeling. And so I'm, I'm really happy with the way that came out, especially because I find that moment sonically sounds the way I feel when I look at that image and when I think of the deep field image. Everyone in the audience downloaded an app on their phone and at the correct point in the composition everyone pressed play on their phones and then all the different apps just gave little bits of electronic sort of sounds and music and gradually you became aware of this electronic soundscape sort of filling the Albert Hall and underscoring the orchestral music that was coming from the stage and it gave a sense of extreme three-dimensionality to the piece of music, which was very akin actually to the feeling I had of looking at the Hubble Deep Field and realizing I was looking back through the deepest volumes of space and time. It's extraordinary how small an area of the sky it is that is teeming with galaxies. We also know now that more likely than not, stars have planets around them. So we can look at this, this small image and know that we're looking at potentially trillions and trillions of planets. I'm not a religious man, but when I look at this, it, it's probably as close as I'll come to a religious feeling. I feel weak in the knees. It's mind-boggling how, how, how magnificent it is. Eric Whitaker isn't the only musician inspired by Hubble. Pearl Jam used a Hubble image of the Hourglass Nebula on the cover of their 2000 album, Binaural. Bands like U2 have used Hubble imagery in their videos, and country artist Beth Nielsen was Grammy-nominated for her children's album, The Mighty Sky. Feathered clouds of golden hues are fashion. I don't particularly want to have music on this, so I'm fading down. It will produce copyright problems, I think, if it goes on YouTube Live. So this is experimentally including bits and pieces of this um, to see what YouTube does with the uh, audio. It may mute part of the clip. Two princess go a little work outside. By 1997, Hubble was due another upgrade. All right, we're ready to go fix that thing. They make it sound easy. But think for a minute about the orbital ballet involved in capturing an object the size of a truck while traveling at five miles a second around the Earth. Astronaut Scott Altman described the experience to Andrew Luck Baker. You start out far enough away that it's just a point of light. And as you get closer and closer, you finally can break out and see the telescope itself and, and recognize, hey, it's really there. People crowd up to the window, look out for that first glimpse. But we're still coming up, moving closer and closer to it. There's a sequence of burns, but actually the final rendezvous portion is hand flown. So we have a little handheld laser, which is kind of like a speed gun the troopers use when you're driving down the highway to tell us, tell me how far away we are and how fast we're coming up, because that information is key to making the decision about what pulse I'll fire on the way in. But Hubble is also round, you know, and reflective. So as they shoot that laser, it doesn't always get accurate readings, and you've got to try and make the right decision. Uh, I'll be over at the controls looking out an overhead window and firing jets to just sort of slowly approach under control 
but you realize all the time we're moving at five miles a second together so we're still going it sounds like a, an intense experience i mean the actual capture and stowing of the telescope into the shuttle's cargo bay where you the crew will then work on it. I mean, how delicate a procedure is that? I mean, in theory, is it quite difficult to damage the actual instrument? Well, that's what we're worried about is any damage or if the arm, as it was trying to grab this pin that was on the side of Hubble, it's kind of a, a can that goes over the pin and captures it and then pulls it in so you have a tight bond between the arm and the telescope. But while you're doing that, the things are just floating and it's kind of like trying to get something out of the pool when you're pushing on the water and it floats away from you, you've got to be very careful. But if I've done a good job and left the telescope stationary in the payload bay without very much movement, we can reach over with the arm and grab the telescope. You're listening to VK3 AML with a regular Saturday night test, uh, VK3 Alpha Mike Lima. At around 11 o'clock, uh, a little bit after, that's 10 past 11, just looking at the remaining time on this documentary on the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, we'll open up on two metres for uh, QSO. Hopefully, if anybody's about to have it by then. With this nice warm night we're having in Melbourne, it's very likely that there'll be people about. VK3 Alpha Mike Lima, back to the recording. With upgraded optics, the images were better than ever. And let's face it, for most of us, Hubble is all about the pictures. You'll find them in books, on posters, coffee mugs, t-shirts, even underwear. Elizabeth Kessler, a lecturer at Stanford University in California, is the author of Picturing the Cosmos, Hubble Space Telescope Images and the Astronomical Sublime. NASA, from long experience, knows that images are a way to keep the public excited and that Funding for the science of here, let's look at the stars, trickles down to other fields of science. So it's the charismatic kind of animal, the polar bear, that gets out there that everyone can see and knows about. But other fields in science, I think, also benefit. And when it comes to Hubble images, space isn't quite as it first appears to the human eye. They're just not as highly resolved. They're black and white. They're speckly. They just don't look as impressive as what we've come to associate with the Hubble Space Telescope images. And that's not because they're trying to manipulate or fool us or anything like that. It just simply wouldn't be possible because if we were to get into a tiny spaceship and fly out to the Eagle Nebula, the light there is so faint, our eyes wouldn't see much at all. Maybe some kind of glow maybe something greenish. So the color is something that is added through digital image processing. In BBC Two's The Cosmos, a beginner's guide, Maggie Adderin met one of the scientists interpreting the Hubble images. The Hubble Space Telescope has several cameras working in different parts of the spectrum. And the job of making its pictures into masterpieces is done by visualization specialists like Lars Lindbergh Christensen. It can really see so much more than we can see with the eye. It can see both infrared and ultraviolet light. Right. And furthermore, the cameras are so sensitive that we really have to somehow convert them to something we can see with the eye. Hubble sees so much more than we do, but to make the detail visible, Lars has to adjust the images until they fit the sensitivity of the human eye. To enhance uh, the fainter parts of the image. So all those dust clouds and everything yes, suddenly come, appear. Come visible. Color comes next. Hubble only has a black and white camera, but it uses it to take three photographs through a red, a blue and a green filter in turn. So Lars has to line up the black and white images and then apply his own colour filters. So now we have them all here. So it's coloured, but it looks a bit fuzzy, a bit out of focus. Just move the green exposure a little bit. So you're just superimposing it? Yes. <laughs> oh, and wow. Already now we can start seeing the, uh, the colours come out really. And it's sharp really. as well. Yes. Absolutely. Now that he has the components for this new picture of the colliding antenna galaxies, Lars adjusts the brightness and contrast of each colour layer until the picture looks right. Something that comes from experience and personal taste, more than scientific judgment. So this is quite an artistic interpretation then. We're combining scientific elements to create something which has some kind of artistic feel. I think that the Hubble has shown us 
a much more colourful universe, if you like. Not a remote universe, but a universe that is up close and intricate in its details. And part of that is to do with the colours that have been chosen to present the images in. And also part of that has just been to do with the relentless amount of images that the Hubble has taken and has been released. And this is a way that even if you understand nothing of the mathematics, nothing of the science behind it, even if you have no interest in any of that, you can still feel a part of this mission because you can just appreciate the images for how beautiful they are. Lecturer in American Studies, Elizabeth Kessler. One is a picture of a section of the Eagle Nebula. When they released this image, it came with the headline, The Pillars of Creation. These pillars of gas and dust kind of create this stair step almost effect. They're backlit and it's colorful. The pillars are yellowish and reddish and brownish. They have these spots of pinkish red stars within them. The background is this blue green color. So it is this really awe-inspiring image, really very beautiful and dramatic. And Pillars of Creation, I should say, it has all these kinds of poetic resonances. I often am reminded of Carl Sagan's lines about we are all made of star stuff. This is a baby picture of, of us even. And in some ways, that's what the scientists talked about. They believed that that was a region where new stars were being formed. But yet, it almost has kind of a biblical resonance, the pillars of creation. It's not only the colors of the Hubble images, but the way they're framed that makes them so appealing. Again, it's no coincidence that they're oriented the way they are, making them reminiscent of 19th century landscape paintings. Thomas Moran, for example, created large-scale paintings that hung in the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., that showed what is now... Yellowstone National Park that showed the Grand Canyon and really demonstrated a kind of awe and wonder and kind of uniqueness of these landscapes and put on display that uniqueness of the landscape. And those artists were accompanying these survey expeditions. And those surveys, just like the Hubble Space Telescope, were financed by the United States government. And those pictures of uh, Yellowstone and of the Grand Canyon served a similar purpose to the Hubble Space Telescope images, a reminder to members of Congress that, hey, this is a worthy scientific expedition, that we should be uh, passing bills that would finance its continuation, that the U.S. government should be supporting science and scientific study in some way. Thanks to Hubble, space is a landscape, just as on Earth. It's emotive, it's tangible, it's colorful. When I was on the International Space Station, I painted a watercolor. It was inspired by the glowing, translucent, and iridescence of colors I saw on the Earth below. A fellow member of the International Association of Astronomical Artists, E. Lee Wilson, has been similarly inspired by the cosmos and Hubble's science and colors of deep space. It's been an inspiration on multiple levels, not just the beauty of the images, but the knowledge that we've gained about our universe and how vast it is and how amazingly beautiful it is. It just inspires this sense of awe. And um, I've been able to use that inspiration to create a series of science-based art. I think that's a really important point that you make about the awe. You know, whether we're scientists or we're artists, when we experience the data, the imagery that's coming back from Hubble Space Telescope, just like when we go and we live on an international space station or, you know, when humans were walking on the moon or I guess I'd ask, how do you think Hubble has changed you? Well, I guess the answer to that would be when I first saw the first deep field image that Hubble created. It's one of these things where you look at that and go, wow, this is, you know, we're just on this little speck of light with pale blue dot looking out billions of light years across the galaxy and across the universe and it really puts things in perspective on how insignificant we are here compared to the vastness of the cosmos and you're listening to vk3 alpha mike lima in melbourne uh putting out the usual saturday night 
uh, test transmission. We'll be following this in 10 minutes at 11.10 p.m. Melbourne time with uh, calling for a QSO um, locally through my two metre transmitter, which for those who have the webcam access is to my right. Uh, concurrently with transmitting on 147.475 megahertz, two meters for people within a hundred kilometers of Melbourne. Uh, we're also streaming YouTube live on internet. If you look for me under VK3 AML 3 April 2021, you should find the, uh, the webcam stream. Not that there's much to see except for me and a uh, Ham shack, which is in a terrible mess, but uh, nevertheless, if people are beyond the 100 kilometres, and I noticed that we have one viewer, Alex Cole, who's in Washington, D.C., of all places. It must be very, very wee hours of the morning there. Um, so we have uh, between six and a dozen people watching uh, this evening, six at the moment. So VK3AML. 3 April 2021 will find you uh, by Google um, the video stream that we're running concurrently with this transmission. Back to the last 10 minutes of the story of the Hubble Space Telescope. Do you think Hubble and, and what it's given us, what it's shared and what it will continue for some, I think, a uh, long time to come has changed all of us on Earth? I think so. Throughout human history, we've learned of this expanding universe, um, you know, from the time that we thought the Earth was flat, and then from the time that we discovered that the cosmos didn't revolve around the Earth, that the Sun was the center of our solar system, and the solar system is not the center of the galaxy, and the galaxy is not the center of the universe, and it puts things in perspective, I think. I really like what Carl Sagan said was that Humanity is a way for the cosmos to know itself. And I think Hubble has really helped us experience that in a much deeper level than we ever had before. Discovery, close and lock your visors and initiate O2 flow. Have a safe journey to Hubble and continue man's quest to unveil the secrets of the universe. We'll see you in eight days. Discovery copies of visor pseudo two. Christmas 1999 and Space Shuttle Discovery returns to Hubble. With its positioning system failing, the telescope has shut down into safe mode. So much work needs to be done that this third servicing mission will also lead to a fourth two years later. This is Mission Control Houston, uh, back aboard Discovery now uh, with uh, two astronauts uh, well into the task of replacing and changing out the rate sensor units looking over the shoulder of John Grunsfeld uh, into the aft shroud uh, section of the telescope. John Grunsfeld will fly both missions. I was on the end of the robotic arm, and I'm looking up at this huge, magnificent telescope, and I just, you know, my skin was sort of crawling, and, and I had that odd feeling like, you know, is this really happening? And I couldn't help myself. I just reached out with my index finger and kind of touched Hubble, you know, to make sure that it was really real, and of course it was. You know, I'll never forget that first moment of just reaching out to touch uh, the Hubble telescope, because it is the holy grail of astronomy. I'm having to censor some of the music on this because uh, it may cause cr uh, copyright Just troubles. Um, and on ham radio, even in Australia, where music is illegal, we tend to avoid in it. Literature. But in recent years, its science has also changed science fiction. And again, fading. Mm. Who has seen a science fiction movie or a superhero movie, even if they are set in space? I'm thinking of Guardians of the Galaxy. In the last 
two decades has flown through things that are based on the uh, observations of the Hubble Space Telescope. These fictional stories that show us here's life in space and here's what it's like if you were zooming around. Uh, in the background, they've taken something that's very much based on Hubble Space Telescope imagery and, and use that as the basis for these kinds of fictional worlds of what space is like. I remember J.J. Abrams' Star Trek reboot and the very end of the film when they're doing the credits and the original Star Trek music, instead of sort of warping through black space with tiny stars, suddenly it was all colourful nebulae and, and it's a big step change in the way art and science fiction presents the imagery of space on film. They think space is very multicoloured and that there are nebulae everywhere. Of course, the, the truth is a bit somewhere in between. Muting music. Sorry about that, fellas. Um, but uh, something that's necessary for ham radio. VK3 AML. Houston Atlantis. Hubble has arrived on board Atlantis with the arm. The 2009 mission to Hubble would be the last chance to upgrade the telescope. Uh, amazingly, the exterior of Hubble, an old man of 19 years in space, still looks in fantastic shape. No kidding, it was going to be the last one because we were retiring the space shuttle. So there's going to be no way to get there with the equipment that we would normally have. And there was no plan to do anything beyond our mission. So we knew that it was we were, had the last crack at it. And so we wanted to get as much done as we possibly could. Mike Massimino who would later go on to guest star in the sitcom The Big Bang Theory, was on his second visit to the telescope. Mike Massimino's reflection uh, in the aft shroud of the Hubble Space Telescope uh, as he uh, prepares to uh, open the doors, uh, protective doors over the fixed head star trackers and the rate sensor units. The Space Boffins podcast spoke to Mike a couple of years ago at the Intrepid Air and Space Museum in New York, where he's now a senior advisor. Yes. You were dealing with things like stripped bolts and things, and obviously you can practice yeah, this again and again. Yeah, that was a mistake. That wasn't planned. Oh, okay. I, I, I was screwed say, that tell one him up. Tell how we broke it. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that was that wasn't in the game plan. Like, oh, strip that. Strip. Yeah, no, we uh, yeah, I, I uh, stripped a bolt on it. We had to remove some of the pieces of the instrument on the outside in order to gain access to the inside, and we were, you know, those were relatively easy to get to, and we, you know, we, we planned and practiced, but they never gave us an issue in any of the training, but that's exactly what I, uh, I, I messed up on was I stripped a screw trying to remove this handrail. Okay, Drew, I'm having trouble with this one on the lower right. I don't want to strip the thing. That darn handrail. Sunset in 11 minutes. And the solution was to, to just, after after lots of trying other things, the, the ground did a test and the ground meaning the control center people in Houston and in the Goddard Space Flight Center engineers are running around on a Sunday <laughs> trying to fix this problem that I created and the solution was to just tear the thing off the bubble, <laughs> which might sound like an easy solution, but uh, we had to be careful in doing that. Uh, they had to do a test first of all to see if I could actually do it, and then once they did that, they were concerned about debris going into the telescope or coming out and, and hitting us, so I taped the bottom of it to contain all the debris that would be created, and that worked pretty well. And then from then on, we had to do the regular, regularly scheduled stuff. We had, a, we had a display here, actually, yeah. and we displayed the handle that Mike had to break off, not to just co constantly <laughs> embarrass him, yeah. but to show the public that, that troubleshooting in space, they could do it, and they could fix yeah. their problems. You're listening to VK3 AML. In about five minutes, we'll be starting uh, a callback for QSOs on two metres, uh, concurrently with the transmission on two metres, 147,475. We're running YouTube Live this week. Um, if you search VK3AML 3 April 2021 on the internet, you should find us. So give that a try if you're having trouble with the RF, if we're a bit scratchy. If you're curious to look in on what a messy ham shack looks like, feel free. Um, alternatively, for those uh, who are... 100 kilometres or less from Melbourne, probably the 147.475 two metre outlet is the best one. This is VK3 AML. Back to the last couple of minutes of this documentary on the Hubble Space Telescope. Five seconds, the mode switches in auto. 
three, two, one, release. John, I'm the witness on this. You actually were the last guy to, to pat it goodbye. What were you thinking when you patted Hubble goodbye? What was going through your mind? Happy voyages. I hope everything that we did worked. <laughs> it's hard not to think of Hubble as something alive. But you know, I really was thinking of Hubble as a friend. John Grunsfeld, the last person to touch the Hubble Space Telescope. In the 11 years since that final mission, Hubble has continued to astound. And thanks to the efforts of engineers and astronauts, it's still in good shape. In 2021, the giant new James Webb Space Telescope is due for launch. But despite its advanced age, Hubble shows no sign of slowing down. Hubble's legacy for our science and culture will last long after it's shared its final image. Good morning, outer space from all the human race. It's time to stay. And there you go, the 30-year uh, mission of the Hubble Space Telescope. There are very few satellites that have such an extraordinary life. Of course, it's had several maintenance um, trips up to it by the shuttle, but now that the shuttle missions have stopped, uh, nothing further is possible there. This is VK3AML with a regular Saturday night transmission, test transmission, I guess. Um, there's one item I'd like to play for those of you. I know there are a number of you who uh, tune into this for vintage audio or material related to the history of sound recording, and something has turned up this week which I think is worth listening to, and that is the BBC has released the earliest magnetic recording of one of their own transmissions that they've been able to find, uh, made on a device called a blatnophone. Um, the Blattnophone was a steel tape recorder devised by a German engineer named Ludwig Blattner, first commercialised in 1929, but it really wasn't until the BBC adopted it in 1932 that it saw any active use. Uh, the use that the BBC had for it was time-shifting shortwave transmissions from other nations which were broadcast... Uh, to appeal to a large audience, but that were broadcast from the country of origin at a time when most Brits were either asleep or it wasn't a peak listening period. And the very first Blattnophone recording of a shortwave broadcast was for an imperial conference, a conference what, which we would now call the uh, Commonwealth Chogham Conference, in those days far more important because, of course, Britain at that time was ruling India, and uh, let me see here. You'll hear on this recording, which is from acetate discs dubbed in the late 30s from the original magnetic recording made on the Blattnophone, an extraordinary machine, used three three-phase motors on it, each half horsepower. It drove steel tape, one-eighth of an inch wide, about the same dimensions as a cassette tape, but made of fairly thick steel, through the heads at 1.5 meters per second. When you switch that machine on with its one meter wide reels of steel tape, you stood back. Anyway, this is July 1932, the oldest surviving British radio program to be recorded on magnetic tape of a form. And we'll have to start that again because I didn't have the volume up. I'm an idiot. There we go. Back to the start. On Thursday, July the 31st, 1932, at 11 o'clock in the morning, representatives of His Majesty's Dominion within the British Empire assembled in conference at Ottawa. The proceedings, part of which you will hear now, were broadcast throughout the Empire and the United States of America. Broadcast was received in London and recorded at the headquarters of the British Broadcasting Corporation by the Blattnophone Schiller process as follows.
the earliest surviving magnetic recording made by the BBC of their own transmissions back in 30th of July 1932, nearly 90 years ago. Now, I'll call for any hams who would like to call back to us on... Uh, on uh, 147 475. Hopefully somebody will be there to talk to us. I'd better bring the loudspeaker closer to the mic. There we go. Primitive way of patching two metres, but there you go. This is VK3 Alpha Mike Lima. Do we have anybody on two metres? VK3 AML calling CQ and standing by. Yeah, VK3ACZ. Hello, Peter. VK3ACZ, VK3 Alpha Mike Lima. Um, and you're going out over the uh, YouTube Live as well. Um, have you been listening long? VK3ACZ, VK3 AML. Yeah, VK3ACZ, Alpha from VK3ACZ. I just left a little pause there in case anybody else uh, was going to call in as well. Uh, yes, no, I've been listening right from the very start. In fact, I was rather delighted when you introduced the subject matter for tonight. Um, uh, I'm uh, intensely fascinated by astronomy and all aspects of it and uh, always surprised when I find people that have no interest. But anyway, you started uh, uh, brilliantly with uh, Henrietta Swan Leavitt uh, and the uh, her research into the Seaford variables. Uh, she's a bit of a pin-up girl of mine. I carry a deep little uh, besotted crush on the lady. I even have a, her Wikipedia uh, uh, portrait photo on my mobile phone. Uh, rather an impressive lady, uh, cut short at uh, age 53 from stomach cancer. But uh, And as your broadcast mentioned, you know, very important in the scheme of things. And, and um, uh, Edmund Hubble... Uh, wrote on the back of her uh, wonderful discoveries. And, of course, uh, Jocelyn Bell as well was the next one off the rank. Um, uh, one of my favourite stories about uh, Jocelyn was the uh, the problem with the background cosmic radiation, whereas they, uh, they were receiving a, a hashy noise and thought that it must have been pigeon poo on the antennas and, and did a big clean-out at the time. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, and... Um, and uh, good that uh, Clint Jeffries was having a, a listen as well because uh, he's the other broadcast that uh, fills my weekend. Friday nights is compulsory listening. I have done to, for a couple of years to his broadcast. Uh, and uh, since discovering yours, of course, it's the same with uh, the history of recordings and all that. And I'll, I'll go on to the last point, uh, uh, the 90-year-old transmission, uh, just stunning. Uh, it's just amazing the things that you pull up for our entertainment and... Uh, we're really blessed to have you uh, uh, doing this stuff and sharing it all with us. So thank you very much for that. And uh, going back a little bit to uh, the Hubble Space uh, Telescope, uh, I would, um, in the 90s, I used to uh, get on the... No, it wouldn't be in the 90s. It would have been in the early 2000s. Um, on Heavens Above website, I would, I would get the predictions for Hubble... Uh, going over and uh, it's it, because it's up a lot higher I think it's eight to nine hundred kilometers it's not very bright but uh, it's still a visible object when it's going past and uh, it was one of my great delights to see the um, a space shuttle separating it from it on one occasion uh, that was a bit of a buzz can't remember the date now but anyway uh, I've uh, waffled off long enough for this over thanks so much for the broadcast just been super fantastic uh, really hit my niche uh, Back to you there, Chris, uh, VK3AML from VK3ACZ. VK3ACZ, VK3AML returning. Um, thanks, Peter. Uh, it was nice to meet you face-to-face -face for the first, well, I think the second time at the meeting of the Sherbrooke uh, Radio Club that I attended about a week ago. And uh, uh, impressive group of people there too, particularly impressed with uh, Jim 3 amns Outback caravan with all of the fittings that it's got for uh, not only survival but comfort out there. He's obviously thought it through over a large number of years very carefully and of course having a, a job with National Parks 
in his working life, he'd know a lot about um, um, uh, creature comforts on the job, uh, tracing various birds, I think. He was tracing birds and animals of various types for national parks. Everywhere from here to Whoop Whoop, um, particularly Central Australia. Um, the uh, subject with the astronomy, I, I, I've always had a an interest in astronomy. In fact, uh, when in primary school, I remember I was asked what I wanted to do for a future occupation. Uh, <laughs> I put down three things, one, two, three. One, radio astronomer, two, swagman, <laughs> and three, garbage collector. And at one time or other in my life, I've probably fulfilled all but the radio astronomy part, and that I think I've made up for with um, work on modulated light beams through the atmosphere, um, which incorporate a lot of principles that are used in astronomy, uh, low light detection, um, cryogenic cooling in some cases, optics, uh, being able to combine my hobby of uh, ham radio with something that vaguely relates to astronomy in modulated light communication has been a, an interesting one. Uh, and meeting people like yourself, of course, is, is, is also very interesting. Um, I'm told by people watching the video stream that it drops from time to time. Apparently, it's very reliant on national and international uh, traffic on the internet and uh, it may be related to the number of people who look in at the moment there are 12 watching um so and one in washington dc of all places so you're being seen and heard fairly widely so and one in washington dc of all places so you're being seen and heard fairly widely vk3 acz vk3 aml Yeah, and just another pause there in case anybody else is going to join us. Uh, VK3AML from VK3ACZ. Well, uh, you're being heard around the other side of the world. That's uh, pretty good coverage, I reckon. Pretty good indeed. Uh, better than HF at the moment. I didn't have the most successful day with it. The uh, uh, the figures, the solar figures seem to be all right, except we're down to zero sunspots. But anyway, I digress. Um, I listened for a short while to the YouTube stream, and I... Uh, you did mention that it's probably slowing down and buffering because of the number of people on, so I thought, well, I don't really need to uh, watch it for too long. With me, albeit that it's coming through my mobile phone, there was a five to six second delay. Uh, so, yeah, I, I only looked for a short while. Good to see your little studio there. Good to see your uh, call sign on the other screen there to your right. And uh, all looked good. So, yeah, I, I, look, I can't compliment you enough on, uh, especially tonight, uh, I'm always trying to find uh, new ways of saying thank you and uh, express my appreciation for what you do. But, uh, yeah, this was on a whole new level again. And as I said before, uh, Clint uh, uh, coming up and having a listen was, I think, is just the icing on the cake because uh, he's the expert. And why not give him a bit of a quick plug? Uh, Friday nights, uh, uh, what is it, 2200 local time, on uh, 80 metres, 3541, for an hour and a bit of uh, astronomy news and uh, snippets and interesting things. Uh, always good fun. Discovered him by accident a couple of years ago and been a regular listener ever since. Uh, as I said in the previous over, uh, same with yours, although I uh, discovered you your broadcast a lot more recently. But anyway, uh, back over to you and uh, let's see if there's anybody else who wants to join us um, on two metres, uh, VK3 AML from VK3 ACZ. Have we got any more callers on two metres? Uh, VK3 Alpha Mike Lima, East Burwood, 20 kilometres east of Melbourne CBD. Uh, calling CQ along with Peter VK3ACZ. Anybody there? Looks like you're the only one at the moment, Pete. Um, VK3ACZ, VK3 Alpha Mike Lima. Uh, I hope this is giving people a, a reasonable 
exposure to what ham radio is like. Um, one of the reasons I, I do the Saturday night transmission is I listen to radio a lot. I was involved with it um, from a broad broadcaster's point of view, particularly back in the 70s and early 80s, um, starting with community radio and moving on to the ABC and a few other um, organisations. And um, what disappoints me is the lack of quality in a lot of the spoken word material that you hear on radio, uh, particularly Midnight to Dawn, the number of really dismal people that ring into um, uh, callback sessions on particularly 3AW, the Murdoch outlet, uh, is frighteningly low in entertainment value, in interest value, not so much entertainment value that I'm concerned about here. In fact, if it's entertainment here, it probably is illegal. So it's more from the point of view of information, science and technology that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put out the stuff that uh, that's there. Uh, Clint has just messaged you on text, Peter. He says, thanks, Peter. It's been quite... I won't even use the last word that he used because that's the uh, seven-letter four-letter word in ham radio, we'll say quite informational. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, that business um, in the uh, the Act, I looked up the Act, the Radio Communications Act this week, and I found that um, uh, music for Australia is not specifically banned. And in fact, it's used as bridging material for the Wireless Institute's news broadcast and as background in documentaries that are run on amateur television repeaters in Australia. Um, but uh, it does say that uh, entertainment is, is, is banned. Now, what you define as entertainment is probably a moot point. I don't think all music is entertainment, particularly if it's bridging music used to separate news items, one from another. Um, in a magazine-style report. Uh, and we wouldn't be in this hobby if it wasn't entertaining to some extent. I mean, what are we expected to do? Read out a list of river heights, get the stock exchange and read out the stock exchange figures for the day, or worse still, read some religious text. And God help me, there are enough of those on HF. VK3ACZ, VK3AML. Yeah, VK3AML from VK3ACZ. Yeah, well, uh, the <clears throat> last the point you raise is sounds like it's all a job for the lawyers and uh, past the Panadol, I'm starting to get a headache already just thinking about it. Uh, yeah, what does constitute entertainment? You could also say that music that you don't like isn't entertainment either. It's just torture. Hi, hi. But um, anyway, yeah, oh, one other thing... Uh, the broadcast with the Hubble Space Telescope reminded me that on the 31st of October this year, hopefully, we'll have the James Webb Telescope launched, which promises to be even better. And hopefully they've had enough time to uh, perfect everything that it doesn't have the lens problem that Hubble had uh, initially. Uh, talk about red face department, but there you go. Oh, and uh, while we're uh, plugging uh, Clint's broadcast, that's VK3, VKH on a... Uh, Friday evening. It's also on 160 metres. Um, oh, goodness, mental blank sets in. Is it 1865? Uh, oh, but there's also the um, ATV broadcast too via the repeater at um, uh, near the Police Academy at Glen Waverley, which can also be viewed. Uh, I, I shouldn't have gone here. I'm, I'm a bit vague on the on, on the figures, perhaps uh, Clint can uh, call in again since we're giving him a, a well-deserved plug. But anyway, uh, what was my other point? Oh, one other thing, I've, I've never bothered to give you a signal report, even though we're only a few kilometres apart. I think it's 11 k's according to qrz.com, but you are 40 over 9 at my location. Uh, just wondering if I'm uh, roughly the same. You might be running a bit more power than me. Uh, back over to you, Chris. Uh, hopefully somebody else is on the side. Uh, VK3AML from VK3ACZ. Have we got any other breakers who'd like to come in on this VK3AML?
Clint, I think I can get you directly if you uh, if you care to come on two meters. We we might be able to bring you in there. Um, I don't know how strong you are, but we're on one hundred and forty seven four seven five. Um, yeah, what else can I comment on? Um, we've had, uh, as I say, between six and twelve people on the video stream uh, most of the night, probably representing in all about thirty people in and out uh, at various times. Uh, quite often people will come in just as a result of a curiosity about what we're doing here or uh, curiosity particularly from American amateurs about the way amateur radio is run here, which I gather is a little bit looser, a little bit easier than it is in America. Um, as I said before, uh, if you examine our Australian Radio Communications Act, music is not specifically banned in Australia as it is very heavily in America. But there are certain <laughs> frequencies in uh, American usage and up to recently 3840 kilohertz on what they call 75 metres has been a real problem. It's been a, a centre for carrier droppers, music transmitters, and I'm talking about music tra transmitted as a, as a nuisance rather than from the point of view of, you know, just as we're using it uh, as to, to break up different uh, items on a spoke, otherwise spoken word uh, transmission. And uh, to hear the political shenanigans and the uh, hate particularly racial hate that's whipped up on 3840 kilohertz was really something. Uh, there was a chap who was kind of the ringleader there who uh, went on the air under the call sign W6WBJ. I think it might have been a call sign invented by himself, as in W6WBJ, world's best jammer, WBJ. Uh, he was a person who had had his licence uh, nominally revoked about six times over a 10-year period, but he was a lawyer, and each time he'd managed to wriggle out of it somehow. And eventually he was done for uh, transmitting over a, uh, a net in America called the uh, Warfa Net, W-A-R-F-A, Western Amateur Radio Friendship Association, which uh, contained in its ranks quite a few Afro-American people and um, the amount of uh, racial epithets that were coming out of W6WBJ were sufficient for the FCC to finally take action on the man. And uh, he was removed from the air, I believe he was raided. All of his gear was confiscated and um, with the head, sort of the ringleader gone, um, the net fell apart. And now if you tune into 3840 kilohertz, there's virtually nothing there. I listen to it or used to listen to it occasionally on uh, American based web SDRs. Just on that subject, I'm in, uh, I've almost nailed the particular Anan uh, HF SDR that I really want to pursue. I know that uh, the shop out your way now um, is acting as an agent for that and uh, so consequently there'll be hopefully uh, a parallel outlet for this transmission each Saturday night from 9.30pm on around 3670 kilohertz, the frequency that used to be occupied each week for similar things by Dave 3ASE. But Dave, after 40 years worth of doing that stuff, has decided that he wants his Saturday nights back. <laughs> um, I can only do it on the Saturday nights that Prue doesn't want me for something social. So it won't be every Saturday night, but it'll be uh, as many Saturday nights as I can manage. Uh, I was off recently in Tasmania on a tour around there, as you probably are aware. So couldn't do it for that two week period, but uh, here we are back again. And it seems that um, uh, the video as well as the RF is working quite well. So VK3ACZ with a pause in case anybody else would like to break in. And if anybody's listening who wants to look in, uh, we're currently running a parallel 
video stream on YouTube Live. On um, If you look up VK3AML 3 April 2021, that's VK3 Alpha Mike Lima 3 April 2021, you'll find the YouTube stream. And not that there's much to see, just an old bloke sitting in front of a computer keyboard um, talking to friends on the air. VK3ACZ with a pause for any breakers. VK3AML. VK3CSJU, what's up with you? Not a, no problem at all, Clint. And um, I hope you don't think I'm trying to com uh, compete with your area. This is just a a one-off to to put together all of the stuff on astronomy that I've been finding. VK3 CSJ and the group VK3 AML. VK3 AML, VK3 CSJ, Mike Lima, VK3 
I also, as, as you, I also have the, uh, um, the YouTube stream running courtesy of the Yards the Yards stream program. And uh, I'm never too sure uh, who sees that. Uh, I, I, I can see, on, on average, I seem to average about 18, 20, sometimes over 20 views of the, uh, the video, um, which uh, astonishes me because I don't know who it is. <laughs> but um, anyway, I, I try to make it entertaining and um, uh, in, a, in a roundabout way. So uh, yeah, I'll go, I think uh, the, the rules are a little bit uh, uh, relaxed here. Yeah, you know what I mean? I don't think there's too many. Um, and it just depends on what you do. <laughs> I think there was one night. Um, Usually after the broadcast, uh, I, when I sort of officially finish up, uh, I'll, I'll tend to play something on ATV, uh, something historic, uh, much the same as what you do as well. Uh, there's quite a number of uh, uh, radio, uh, items on radio astronomy, and, um, and sometimes I'll, uh, I'll click on those and let it go. Uh, but the danger is, the danger is, uh, I'll, I'll be sitting back yeah, looking at it, and then I'm going to go to sleep, don't I? And uh, the, the, the problem there is that um, uh, with YouTube, <laughs> they like to throw in the odd commercial, don't they? Um, which is really annoying, and I'm, I'm very, very close to having to, uh, to start up a subscription to YouTube just so that I can not have ads anymore. <laughs> um, so I think I've got to about one o'clock. I wake up and, and realise the future has just been running. Uh, and I, you know, God knows what um, the, 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 the thing put over air. But I, I very quickly went to come <laughs> And I think at that time of the morning, there was, uh, I don't think anybody else was really watching uh, on the ATV you know, side of it. Uh, all, uh, all fun and games. But yeah, well, thank you tonight uh, for all uh, the, the, the session tonight there. But, uh, Chris, uh, all the astronomical bits and pieces, really interesting stuff, um, and um, ending up with the Hubble. It's uh, quite some history there, honestly, and uh, we're all looking forward to the James Webb uh, telescope being launched, uh, hopefully this year. It's been put off, it's been put off, it's been put off, but the, the advantage of, uh, of the delays in the, the launch is that the, the technology has changed uh, along the way, and uh, as the technology has changed, they've, they've upgraded the, the the James Webb telescope uh, for modern um, devices and um, it's just gone through. So I think it's got to the point now that we're just going to realise let's, let's launch this damn thing and uh, hopefully it will all work. So, yeah, exciting times uh, coming up, especially with space exploration too. I mean, they're, they're wanting to, to go back to the moon uh, by the end of this year, which is amazing to, to think, isn't it? Um, but this, uh, this, this decade coming up is going to be really, really fascinating to do with, uh, with, um, with going back to the moon and exploring the things. There's, there's, there's even a model uh, that wants a, a, a rotating space station uh, orbit around Earth and, um, uh, and perhaps that's in the love of tourists. Uh, unbelievable, isn't it? But uh, I think, yeah, it's uh, where there's a bull in the way. G'day to you, Sir Peter. I'm sure you can link me here on, on Sir, but the G'day to you, Sir, thanks for very uh, kind words to the K3 uh, email. Uh, VK3CSJ, no worries, Jeff. Yeah, VK3CSJ. Thanks, Clint. Um, interesting, all of that. The James Webb Telescope, I don't know a great deal about, but obviously uh, it would be a great deal more refined, than, particularly in the imaging, I suspect, area than the old um, Hubble, because the Hubble was launched what, much, a little bit more than 30 years ago. And in that time, um, well, just in the video area, uh, we've gone from everybody having ho home video machines that run standard def. We Now, if, if your camera can't do 1080, and most of them can do 4K, you're considered to be a bit... Um, behind the times with your home video. God knows what sort of uh, video equipment they can put on 
um, a, a telescope now in terms of capturing different parts of the spectrum, infrared, infrared ultraviolet, perhaps even X-rays, gamma rays. I don't know what the limits of that technology are. Probably limits would be the limits of what the reflector in the telescope can reflect, and that would depend on the surface material. Back to the moon. Not sure whether I'm so much in favour of manned lunar and Mars exploration. I don't see that we'll gain very much from it. I mean, sure, um, it's nice to think that people are actually up there, but compared to what you can research now with robotic means, it, it, it seems like an awful lot of money and risk for very little payback. Um, I see in Mars uh, they're about to launch in about a week's time, I think, that drone that they can pilot from the Earth. The only thing that's a worry, of course, is that the controls for that are delayed by, I think, six to eight minutes um, from before the transmission from the Earth can, can reach the controls of the drone. So it has to be very largely um, autonomous. Um, and thank you uh, also to the people that have tuned in on, on the video stream. It's nice to see a bit of coverage there. Uh, I'm not putting a video stream on so much for the pictures that were being sent, but more for extending the range of the audio in the material we send. I actually have off the record talked to a couple of radio inspectors about what we do here. And uh, I think they're off the record, very much in favour of the sort of um, value-added information that we're bringing to amateur radio by running this sort of a session where we're running science and technology material, myself, yourself, Dave 3ASC, Steve 3SL. Um, and while some of the entertainment material may get into a grey area, uh, we're not specifically running music programs to entertain or to compete with commercial media in any way. Um, it might be different in America where they the FCC drops on you like a ton of bricks if you do that. It's interesting the differences between American regulations and here, and I've, I've transmitted amateur radio in both countries, in America in 2008 and um, over a month or so. And uh, over there, their attitude to running power up to two kilowatts, I think, is very much freer than it is here. I mean, we can only run, as a general rule, I think 400 watts of sideband or 120 of AM and FM, which seems very little in view of what America can do. But in America, you're much more heavily limited in the content of your transmissions. Um, in that uh, anything resembling music would be absolutely pounded off the band unless you want to be particularly purposely illegal as those people I've mentioned on 3840 kilohertz. Uh, if there are any American hams that are looking in on this, uh, I'd appreciate your comments on the text box at the side of uh, YouTube live. And if anybody listening on two metres wants to have a look in or listen to uh, people with a little bit of latency, about eight seconds, I think, um, if you Google VK3AML 3 April 2021, you should get this video clip or this live video. And we're streaming at 1080p, but I think it might be throttled by the speed of the internet in many cases. I'll hand it round to uh, Peter, VK3ACZ, and uh, see if Peter actually heard you direct Clint or whether he had to listen through my video stream. VK3ACZ and the group VK3AML, with a pause for any other breakers. Yeah, VK3 AML in the group from VK3 ACZ. Yeah, uh, Clint was 20 over 9 at my uh, location in Baronia. Uh, no surprise there. And uh, I, I wouldn't have imagined that I'd be uh, speaking to both my favourite uh, uh, weekend uh, radio presenters. Uh, <laughs> what a 
What a pleasure. Um, I spoke briefly with uh, Clint last night on AT, uh, just to mention a couple of SDR reports. It's one of the things I like to do, see how the broadcast is getting out. Um, uh, it didn't happen last night because there was a, a local station on, but uh, I listened to him on the uh, one of the Hawaii uh, Kiwi SDRs, and uh, he's five by seven sometimes over there, which I'm a bit jealous about because when I try and send my own signal out, um, I don't hear myself on the Hawaii S SDRs, <clears throat> never mind. And uh, sounds like I need to check out the uh, ATV feed for um, the VK3 EKH's ASV broadcast, uh, not just to see uh, Clint asleep either, hi, hi. But, um, <clears throat> and as for you uh, getting your radio going there, uh, Chris, all I can say is I'm looking forward to it because it gives me the same option of being able to listen to it when I go bush and I'm away from um, uh, away from uh, internet access, which I suppose doesn't happen all that often. But as you've seen from the Sherbrooke Radio Club, uh, one of our big things is going bush and playing radio. So uh, that's what we uh, intend to do from time to time. It'd be great to tune into your broadcast. And um, as for your comment about uh, Mars and uh, questioning the expense, uh, that's quite an understandable um, view. And um, I, I guess uh, perhaps one of the greatest things is it's possibly going to answer the great question about life and other worlds. Uh, I think that if it can be established that uh, life existed even at the um, uh, very, very small level uh, in other worlds, it changes the way we think and uh, it wasn't so long ago that we couldn't have imagined that there were planets around most stars, and now it's pretty much accepted. So, uh, yeah, we can broaden our horizons with that, at least, uh, with the research into Mars. And I suppose it's the old child thing, you know, that we've uh, been exploring since, um, since uh, I don't know when, since Moses was a boy. But anyway, uh, uh, I'll hand it back to you, Chris, and... Um, yeah, you're, I said before you were 40 over 9, you're actually 50 over 9 with me. But uh, So, uh, yeah, good signals coming in at my QTH. Uh, back to you, Chris, VK3 AML and the group from VK3 ACZ. I gave a bit of a pause there. VK3 ACZ, VK3 AML. Uh, yeah, you, you're, you know, if this radio had a S meter of the old type on it, the needle wouldn't just be hitting the end with a clank, it would be bending the needle. Um, I don't know how many dB over 9, but I cannot hear any noise behind you. Uh, and if you look at the the um, YouTube stream after it's recorded, you'll be able to hear that for yourself. Um, it's one of the handy things about internet. You can remotely hear yourself if you want to a check on what you're doing in all sorts of ways these days. It's uh, in the old days, um, calling CQ on HF and waiting for somebody to come back from another country was um, relied on chance very much. These days, you can dial a receiver up in a place like New Zealand or California, Indonesia, India, Middle East, and um, listen for your own signal on 20 metres and, and, and in that way get a more quantitative view of propagation and the possibility thereof. Um, so I've often <laughs> was discussing with an amateur who'll go nameless um, that process of listening to yourself off a web SDR and he compared it to, um, without saying too much, onanism. <laughs> on an intellectual basis, <laughs> it was rather crude, but anyway, makes the point. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm glad you can hear Clint. You're probably hearing Clint a little bit stronger than me because I hear him with a bit of scratchiness uh, behind him. I think there is the Police Academy hill between me and him, so I'm getting him probably by diffraction around the side. Um, the signal does vary a bit from Clint too, so he's kind of uh, on my political edge, uh, sorry, my radio edge. Why was I thinking politics then? I'm not. Uh, the only reason I worry about music with this Saturday night transmission has nothing to do with radio at all. I, I know that it'll be tolerated there by most people that are on at the time when we transmit this stuff. 
uh, what I'm worried about is that the music, particularly if it's modern background music by the Stones or whatever, people that are well known, people that have recorded the last 10, ten years or so, is that it will hit a copyright hit on YouTube once it's recorded and up there. Uh, I know it happens within about 20, 24 hours. And that's why I was lowering the volume on the various musical segments if they were of an extended nature. I think for very brief segments, it comes under the fair dealing um, clause of internet usage. Uh, and we have eight viewers now on internet. So I'd better hand it back to Clint, VK3CSJ. How are things down there? And can you tell us any more about the James Webb Telescope? VK3CSJ and group. With a pause, if anybody else wants to break, VK3AML. Uh, take it to Sounds like nobody. Righto. VK3AML. Broadcasting on YouTube and uh, the World Wide Web. Super, super high five. Uh, VK3ACZ, VK3CSJ, Nary Warren South. And uh, I'm, I'm watching you, with, I'm now watching you on the computer upstairs here. I've got the volume turned down because it's just a delay. But um, yes, I can tell that it's uh, super high audio and video. <laughs> In fact, uh, I, I had to go up and have a close look. Uh, from, this, uh, from the angle of the camera, it looks like you're graffiti on your computer screen there because the reflection from your other computer screen is right into uh, your other screen. And it's, it's like it's just graffiti. Yeah, yeah, it's quite uh, it's funny to look at. Um, but, uh, it's, and, and of course, again, the angle also makes that screen right in front of you look like it's about a mile long. Uh, <laughs> it's a really huge screen. Anyway, um, all very good. Uh, yeah, um, 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 Peter, you're, you're um, quite strong. <laughs> um, I, I, I've got one of these uh, dangled radios that is uh, uh, an old TV bar indicator, so I, I prefer an analog meter any day. Um, than the, the animal, uh, LCD things, but you're, you're about 75% for the scale fully quite here, so not a problem at all. Um, whereas, uh, Chris, as Chris has pointed out, uh, we're in the, the marginal area here, and uh, Chris is only about four bars, but uh, so there's a slight, slight bit of noise in the background that's nothing to complain about. So, uh, on uh, this, this particular wireless, actually, uh, a uh, ICOM ID 800 number, the a D-Star box, um, and uh, I've only really just reconnected it up. I, I, I think the, this ID 800 I've had uh, for many years, um, and the VHF UHF station here has uh, sadly been um, uh, all the parts of this connection, and um, uh, I've only got something that it works on the local repeater, but uh, or handheld actually. But, uh, I've only just uh, reconnected this uh, radio up because one, because it's, it's already bolted under the bench here. Um, just needed an antenna connected to it, and power and away it goes. That's what I'm using right now. Um, not sure how much power it puts out. It's probably a 25 watt, or could be 50 watt. Uh, yeah, it might be about 50 watts, 40 or 50 watts uh, on high power. So, but the, the little dual band antenna is high off the ground, so uh, uh, where I, you know, when I was looking at Danny on Danny on West, uh, I had my elevation was four meters above the sea level, and from the, from the top of the tower, I could see the port to look central. Danny West, uh, for VH, um, I do miss that, but here at Narry Warren South, I'm, I'm down near a creek, 23 meters. And uh, yeah, getting out on VHF, uh, UHF is a little, little limiting these days. James Webb. Um, look, all I can tell you about James Webb, uh, off the top of my hat, is that it's mostly in the infrared. Uh, it's going to be looking where, where with space, with, uh, with the Hubble, it's um, it's more in the optical uh, uh, um, spectrum. 
um, and that they have uh, uh, wide field uh, lenses and narrow field lenses and things of that sort. Um, I mean, <coughs> with, with the Hubble, one of the unique images that uh, Hubble did uh, at one stage was they picked on a part of the sky that was otherwise uh, boring. I mean, nothing, nothing was there, just the blank through the sky. And this, this image has now become quite famous for um, uh, the, the, uh, the Hubble because uh, they left the telescope focused on that uh, otherwise dull part of the sky for, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe, let's say, 15 minutes, whatever it was, long exposure. And uh, when they had developed the, the image as such, uh, what was revealed was hundreds of galaxies. Uh, they could actually count, literally count in the, in the image, uh, over 100 gal galaxies in that one view. In fact, a lot more than that. Um, the, the universe uh, is a, a, a pretty big space. Um, the fun. And um, I actually steal that from uh, Contact to uh, Carl Sagan's uh, story, one of my favourite movies. And, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Uh, uh, it's rather, rather interesting just, just how many uh, galaxies uh, are out there in the universe. Um, and, uh, you know, life surely uh, does exist or must exist uh, elsewhere. And, uh, and of course, um, uh, that's just what, as Peter was alluding to, that it's just one of the main reasons why we must go to Mars. I, I agree on the robotic side of it, and I think Mars has been well and truly explored with uh, the robotic craft um, that's been to it. Uh, it's, uh, there's, there's, uh, the success rate of landing on Mars uh, has been a bit of a 50-50 thing. Uh, a lot of the other nations in the world that have sent probes to Mars uh, have unfortunately crashed or failed for some reason. And, um, but the NASA's uh, got a, a pretty good record for uh, uh, landing the first time and getting it to work. And uh, this is a recent uh, uh, Perseverance rover is uh, certainly no exception. Uh, it's, uh, it's a big uh, rover, it's the size of a, uh, a small car. And um, in the next few days we're going to see the, the launch of the, uh, the first uh, helicopter um, ingenuity. Uh, currently, the, the Ingenuity uh, helicopter is uh, Ingenuity being uh, um, called the, from a, a, I think there was a competition that went out, what can we call this helicopter, and some young girl at a, at a, at a school, high school or something like that, just came up with the name Ingenuity, and that's what they used for it. Uh, but it's currently suspended below the, uh, beneath the uh, Perseverance rover. And uh, they're just waiting for a spot where they can uh, uh, drop it off the surface, and the rover will then uh, veer off uh, about 20 metres or so, and uh, then they'll uh, they'll launch the helicopter, and, and you know just to see it fly and land. And that's the first thing it's going to do is go up vertically straight up into the sky by about five metres or so, probably take a picture, and then come straight back down again. Uh, yeah, that, that's uh, that's all happening by the end of this, uh, this coming week, so it's really, uh, really fascinating stuff. But we're, you know, uh, it's, it's like what Peter was saying: you know, the the, um, the the whole endeavour of being able to explore uh, and, and find uh, uh, other places and, and uh, learn about uh, uh, other places is uh, what drives us to uh, to go to Mars and go to the moon. Moon was the obvious uh, first place to go to. It was uh, three days away, and uh, we see it in the sky all the time. So it's inevitable that uh, man was to, to go uh, land on the moon, and um, of course it's going to be a, a stepping stone for uh, for other, uh, well, probably for, for uh, trips and journeys to to, uh, to Mars. Uh, but of course the, the other thing here is that uh, we're we're trying to find. Uh, life of this world, um, something that, that helps explain uh, uh, a little bit about how we uh, came about and if we can find microbes, if it is just microbes um, within the surface of, uh, of Mars, then there's a few boxes there that get well and truly ticked. Um, 
So uh, that's what Perseverance is all about. Uh, this, uh, this particular probe is, uh, um, is out there to find it. It's, been, it's landed in a, in a key location where there was once a delta of uh, rivers um, that, uh, uh, that came together. And, um, and uh, all that water is, of course, now disappeared, but the deposits in the ground is uh, hopefully what uh, we'll uh, find some, uh, some fossils or some microbes that uh, will help uh, explain a few things. So uh, I, look, I've, I've always said, uh, actually, that if it's the, the very last thing I see, I'm on, on my deathbed and I'm moments away from dying. It's got to be the last, the last thing I see is man land or set foot on, on the surface of Mars. I was around to see man land and set foot on, on the moon. Uh, I was nine years old. I remember it well. And uh, <coughs> that, I think it me off uh, in uh, the science and astronomy, one way or another. Uh, and of course, uh, Mars is the, the only only planet in the solar system that you know, a partial rich uh, aspect. It's, it's just unfortunate that Venus is so, um, uh, um, you know, the, the atmosphere on Venus is just so simple. It's, uh, it, it's just a, a place that we just cannot go to and if you've got a, a, a probe that will withstand the, the extreme temperatures. Um, Pity that Venus is like that. You know, Carl Sagan uh, once uh, said that uh, Venus is quite possibly quite a tropical planet. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, anyway, um, so um, Mars uh, is, is definitely the, the place to uh, for the extreme side of engineering and the extreme side of uh, the human risk element. And uh, uh, I think if we can send um, men and woman to uh, uh, Mars and come back safely, then it's going to be uh, something pretty, pretty amazing. Um, yeah, so um, it's interesting stuff to do. Uh, and um, something else that you mentioned, uh, yeah, I'm not too sure about uh, EFCC and, and how their regulations are. I've never really read into that. Uh, I'm not too certain how tight they are over there. Um, but um, I, I, yeah, I agree with the the, um, uh, the the limitations that we can have over here, or that we do have over here, and what we can do, uh, providing that it's certainly you know, within uh, a sensible uh, aspect and sensible reason, um, and, and, and that it's on that sort of sensible. Uh, Informative nature. So, uh, with the ATV side of it, it's uh, interesting as to uh, uh, what, what we can put across. There's, also, there's a lot of interesting and informative scientific stuff on YouTube uh, that uh, I often wonder, you know, just uh, how much of it we could possibly uh, uh, run across the ATV repeater. A lot of it goes for uh, about an hour, and I often think that's, that's too long. Stuff that goes for maybe um, up to half an hour. Uh, but uh, uh, there's some very, very interesting lectures uh, out there by um, renowned uh, uh, astronomers and scientists that would make some very, very interesting viewings. But a lot of those lectures often go for over an hour and um, uh, it's probably a little too long. So uh, I, I don't play those, but um, all very interesting stuff to do. Anyway, uh, the K3 AML, the K3 TSJ. VK3 CSJ, VK3 AML. Very interesting, Clint. Um, there were two segments that I was holding in reserve. I won't play them now. Uh, also related to what you were talking about. One um, was a 10-minute clip done by a man named Guy Consolmangos. C-O-N-S-O-L-M-A-N-G-O-S. Sounds like a Spanish name. He speaks with a thick American accent, uh, American English accent. And um, in 1975, he did a doctoral thesis on Europa 
and the fact that it was large enough and massive enough to generate internal heat by um, um, nuclear processes of, of fusion in its core. And he predicted that there would be a water ocean around it on the basis of um, a water ocean covered by ice around it on the basis of the spectral observation of Europa. And uh, now he feels even more strongly that life will be found there if it's found anywhere outside of the Earth um, in the universe. I think there are NASA probes planned for Europa within the foreseeable future, the next few years. Um, but Europa is a particularly interesting one. Uh, largely a water world covered in cracked ice and with more than a few geysers so that the internals of whatever ocean is under the ice can be probably observed from what's in the geysers. Um, the other clip that I didn't play that I held in reserve was um, narrated by the star of your favourite film, Clint, Contact, Jodie Foster narrating... Um, a documentary which you may have seen it was it won an award um, I'm just trying to find it on my list here it's called Beyond the Visible the story of the very large array and it largely concerns radio astronomy um, as practiced worldwide by linked radio telescopes but particularly by the very large array that's in, I think, Argentina or Chile. I'm not quite sure. One of the South American countries. So I was holding those in reserve. If you're interested in any of those, I can form them into MP3s and send them to you for your own purposes, should you be interested. Um, each week, I spend about a half a day just doing a bit of a... Uh, coast around the internet looking for suitable audio material for these Saturday night sessions, mostly related to history of broadcasting, history of recording, that sort of thing. But on this occasion, I just found enough in the way of scientific material related to astronomy to make it interesting. It's a quarter past 12. I better hand it back to um, Peter 3K3ACZ, presuming you're still there, Peter. And I heard somebody keying up very briefly, a carrier over the top of you, Clint, obviously seeing whether they could get in. So if they'd like to speak, please do speak just before Peter comes in with a pause, VK3ACZ, VK3AML. Nothing heard here, Chris. No, go ahead. Okay, VK3AML in the group from VK3ACZ. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Clint was right about uh, James Webb uh, being uh, mainly in the infrared uh, scheme of things. A couple of things that I do recall, uh, it's going to be one and a half million kilometres away from Earth and it's not going to be in orbit uh, like Hubble is. It's going to be uh, in its own little zone there. It's also got a bigger mirror, which means it's going to be able to look a lot further back in time. And you probably gather from my initial comments in my first over that uh, I'd like to go back in time and meet uh, Henrietta. <laughs> That's my uh, big fantasy. You forgive me for that uh, little indulgence. And, of course, the idea of the infrared is you know, being able to peer through dust that you can't ordinarily. I think Hubble does look in the infrared, but it is, as Clint said, it's mainly in the optical and I think in the uh, ultraviolet as well. But anyway, uh, just uh, uh, as a... I, I gave a bit of a thumbs up for uh, Clint's broadcast. I'll just, uh, Clint, I'll just say to you how much I appreciate Chris's broadcast too. I've been able to hear uh, Florence Nightingale's voice, uh, Thomas Edison's voice for the first time, uh, things that I'd not had the opportunity to do before just because of an incredibly vast collection of the old uh, cylinder recordings and all that. And, uh, yeah, it's something I look forward to just for the, uh, the knowledge uh, and the experience of uh, history that's imparted each broadcast. So, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty good. Fridays and Saturday nights are uh, uh, a real blessing. Oh, by the way, Clint, the word you were looking for in trying to describe Venus and what a pity, I think the word was inhospitable. Uh, it sounds like a very ghastly 
place. Remember that Russian probe lasted just a few minutes before it, it stopped functioning, the uh, first one that actually landed on the surface of the place. It certainly sounds like um, hell, definitely. And Europa, I believe the uh, the problem with Europa will probably be that uh, awful uh, radiation field that's uh, generated and, and given off by uh, Jupiter itself. It's another uh, gas giant that doesn't sound like a very nice place to be. But anyway, oh, guys, just as a little, little bit of a reminder, I'm looking at a clock on the wall and it says 2314. I've already set it back an hour. Remember to set your clocks back, guys. Anyway, back over to you, and I might uh, start winding down at this point. Uh, thanks again for tonight's broadcast, and thanks to Clint for coming up. Uh, VK3 AML in the group from VK3 ACZ. Well, we had a carrier there. Is there somebody who'd like to join us, VK3 AML? No, just a weak carrier. Uh, and I see that on the text box, Steve VK3ZH has <laughs> joined us. So we have the radio inspector onto us. Oh, dear. Uh, I just hope that you realise, Steve, we're trying to keep it as compliant as possible. Um, I, I'm <laughs> listening for anything that could be modern music that would be questionable for copyright. As much for my worry as to whether it'll pass YouTube from the point of view of copyright um, as anything else, I think uh, you're just using it as, as bridges in documentary material, very difficult to avoid. And uh, just recently I had a look at the Radio Comms Act just to make sure that we were all within limits and I'd say that uh, you'd have to interpret the Saturday night effort fairly narrowly for it to be excluded from the limit um yeah i i just don't know the ethics of sending people to mars for the sake of saying that men have landed on mars when so much can be done without the risk without the cost without the incredible complication of supporting people for months on end in the trip to uh, um and the trip to uh to Mars. And Terry, when you say good morning, I guess that means you're off. We'll catch you another day. Terry, that's VK3 FTJS. Nice to see you there, Terry. Um, and we have seven on at the moment. Um, I suspect there have been a, there's been a revolving door going on a little bit with, um, with, this, uh, with this transmission. Anyway, around to Clint. Um, saying morning to Steve. Yeah, uh, Terry. <laughs> I've passed it on. Um, not sure that there's very much more that I can comment on, except that um, while I was researching audio material that I could play, I came across a lot of interviews with people involved with the start of the lithium-ion battery, and uh, that might be a, a suitable... Uh, jumping off point for another Saturday evening's documentaries because the lithium battery has made possible all sorts of things that haven't been possible previously. Uh, the easy cartage of reasonable um, amounts of amp hours for portable operation of up to 50 watts now as a result of lithium batteries being developed. Of course, the uh, electric car has been very much more facilitated by lithium batteries. Uh, the drone, um, ditto. So this whole thing of lithium battery technology has really opened up a whole new area of electronics, as has uh, the high output light emitting diode. I mean, uh, domestic lighting has been revolutionized in the, the last 20 years. I remember when... Um, Mike Groth and I imported the first two Luxian high output red LEDs for our modulated light experiments from the American country, a company that made them, LumiLEDs, which I think was an association of Hewlett Packard and Philips on the development of the commercial high output LED. And this was back, when would it have been? About 2002, 2003. And we had to get a letter 
from uh, Mike's place of employment, that is the Tasmanian Environment Protection Authority, to allow this American company to export that material to us because at the time they thought that it might be used by Mr. Gaddafi. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I knew the second time in my life that anybody has suggested that I could be a a, uh, a terrorist. The other time I was out portable with a um, a portable um, beam antenna on a pole, standing on a domestic nature strip somewhere on top of a hill, uh, just after the time when John Howard handed out the... Uh, um, the magnetic um, fridge magnets with the number for the terrorist hotline and this blonde woman, blonde, please note, I hope there are no blondes listening, <laughs> came up to me from inside the house and she said, I've seen you. I said, what do you mean, madam? Uh, I've seen you and you're transmitting. How do I know you're not transmitting to a submarine from Afghanistan? And I said, well, madam, um, Afghanistan is about <laughs> a thousand miles from the nearest sea, so it would be quite something if they had a submarine. And she said <laughs> to that, you seem to know a lot about Afghanistan. And she was being serious. Anyway, um, it caused me a little bit of mirth, but I moved on. Then I decided I'd better ring the police just in case they get upset. So I told this story to a policewoman at the Box Hill Police Station on the phone straight afterwards. <laughs> and after I got about three quarters of the way through the story, she started laughing and she said, don't worry, sir, just forget it and hung up. Um, so that was my sole accusation of terrorism. Um, I better hand it on to... to uh, Peter VK3 AC said, I know you want to get away, Peter, and it's getting close to half past, half past midnight. Um, and hello to anybody from abroad who's tuned in. I, I know that there are one or two from Washington, D.C. have looked in tonight. Wonderful. Uh, VK3 ACZ, uh, possibly for a final, VK3 Alpha Mike Lena. Yeah, VK3 ACZ in the group... Uh uh, try again. VK3 AML in the group from VK3 ACZ. Yeah, just quickly, uh, and I will say 7-3 and make this my last over uh, to you both. Um, quick one for you, uh, Chris. Uh, I don't think that you're a great sports person, but uh, <laughs> some time back the ABC played a, uh, uh, a bit of a cricket nostalgia item during the tea break or rain break or something in the cricket now it concerns the tide test uh, up in Brisbane between Australia and the West Indies and I think it was Wes Hall one of those guys who he was bowling the very last over and it's at, it's at a dinner or something like that and it's a very comical piece uh, I've been trying to track it down for some time just wondering in your vast collection whether you would have had that uh, I might be drawing a bit of a long bow there because, as I said, I'm not sure if uh, sports your thing. But with such a, uh, a fantastic collection of um, memorabilia of an audio kind, I just wondered. Anyway, if you had that, I'd be uh, interested. But I'll I'll leave you both with that and um, and move on from here. Uh, thanks once again uh, for everything, guys. It's been great to speak to uh, my two favourite broadcasters, as I said before, and. Um, uh, I'll look forward to listening to you both uh, next week. Anyway, VK3 AML in the group from VK3 ACZ. Uh, cheers, guys, and good night. Hello. Yes, hello. Who's that? Do we have a breaker there, VK3 Alpha Mike Lehman? And just somebody who said hello. Hello. <laughs> What else can I say? Uh, I'm not sure which year you're talking about. A tied test. I'll look it up. Um, the only cricket that I've ever been involved with the preservation of films has been related to the very earliest, earliest talkies, um, 1929 through 31. Don 
Bradman and the 1929 Australian Eleven, which was uh, headed by my father's first boss. I'm just trying to think of his name, who was a teacher. So was my father. Um, no, it won't come to me, but uh, my father's first boss was uh, later the headmaster of Melbourne High. Um, in charge, it was the captain of the Australian Eleven for 1929 and 1930. But it won't come to me. But I gather from what you're saying, the Tide Test must be something fairly recent. And I really, I was a member of the Anti Football League. I uh, went along to one of their ceremonial football burnings on the hallowed turf of the MCG, and we were all thrown out. <laughs> We left a nice little mark in the middle of the MCG, a burn mark. Um, I know that Dave, 3ASC, feels similarly about sport. Uh, he took a long shot of, while we were on Deal Island. He got a very extreme telephoto shot of some people playing cricket on the beach on uh, the adjacent uh, Erith Island, which was about four kilometres away. And as they hit a six, he said, oh, look, they've got a hole in one or whatever they call it in cricket. And I thought, good on you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, he takes so much notice. He's been involved with the ABC where he's broadcast cricket from time to time as a panel operator. And on one occasion, I remember him telling me that he fell asleep during one of those. Um, so round to you, Clint. You may want to be getting away too. Uh, VK3CSJ and the diminish diminishing group VK3AML, perhaps with a pause if anybody wants to break in. VK3AML, CSJ, Tuesday, Thursday, Peter, good to uh, see you on the uh, uh, VZ here and. Um, Um, to, to, uh, you know, to the astronauts, 
feel uh, that uh, to remember what it was like to be on Earth. Um, so uh, but it's, it's vitally important that, uh, that some method of generating gravity is, uh, is generated, whether it's through a, the arbitrary uh, aspect of having a rotating ring um, or something a bit more um, physics orientated uh, uh, than, than some other means generating a, a gravity force, uh, i.e. what you see in Star Trek, for instance. Um, so we're a bit a ways off from that, but uh, I think Mars is the, a trip to Mars, in fact, is, is about to be the, the extreme of, of that. No, no different to uh, to the early explorers uh, um, in their sailing ships that went out in the ocean. Um, not sure where uh, the horizon was going to end, what was beyond it. Um, you know, there's, uh, and to, to the folks that uh, on Mount Everest, it's a place that went to uh, the South Pole and the North Pole, all these extreme aspects that it's in our blood to explore. And uh, I, I know that for me, I mean, I'm a home bod, but uh, I, you know, in all the years that I, uh, I was a marathon runner, I, I used to enjoy exploring new tracks and new places to run. Um, and uh, I just loved it. I really wish I could go back to those uh, years of, uh, of running. Uh, but, uh, I'm an old codger these days, so uh, I'm 60 years of age and we'll open it all. <laughs> um, anyway, that's all another story. Um, yeah, oh, look, it's been great. To, oh, yeah, about the uh, Jodie Foster thing. Yeah, I've got that here. Uh, Chris, it's not a problem. It's, it's probably one of the, the first documentaries that I uh, I ran over ATV um, some time ago. Because uh, it only goes for a short while. It talks about the VLA in uh, New Mexico. And uh, the Cole Jansky uh, VLA is pulled down. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's half of a, quite a few very interesting aspects to, uh, to the VLA. So, uh, a very, very nicely put together documentary that doesn't uh, do any harm in uh, that uh, run across the TV. Um, yeah, so uh, I've, I've got that on the hard drive here. The Alaska Radio is trying to be orientated in. Uh, all very good. In fact, we, we were going to uh, head up to Heathcote uh, today, uh, our radio telescope that we have up at uh, the Leo Maldark Sky site in LMPSS. Um, we've got a, um, an eight and a half metre dish up there, a 30 foot dish, and uh, we've, we've got that all motorised now. And, uh, um, we've got a, a receiver, a dedicated receiver on that for uh, detecting. Uh, uh, the uh, hydrogen line uh, emission, and uh, we were heading up there today to do some calibration on the dish, but uh, unfortunately my master Subaru uh, started to overheat. I've got this master temperature problem with this car, and uh, I, I got as far as um, uh, Moorland Road, I think it is, on, on the, the highway out, and I could do a U-turn and come back home, so i um, very disappointed about that. I haven't been up into uh, the, uh, the Dark Sky site since uh, Christmas 2019. Um, and I was going up there to meet a, another couple of blokes up there too that were popping out, so I said my apologies. But uh, yeah, we're hoping to get this uh, radio telescope uh, tuned and uh, running well and uh, mapping the sky in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, on the hydrogen line. And, uh, uh, doing some great things with this uh, telescope, um, so uh, very exciting, some exciting times coming in that respect. Anyway, I'll leave you with it. Um, it's, good to, well, it's very rare for me to come up uh, on the, uh, the time of the night to uh, either yourself or even with Dave when he was uh, on, um, and even with Steve. <laughs> I often listen to Steve and Hank uh, talking. Um, I go to sleep with to them. Uh, but um, uh, I really uh, come up and, uh, and say anything, so it's a free one. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Chris. Good on you, mate. Cheers to all the, the listeners you got there. And uh, I've, I've noticed that your YouTube uh, uh, count is, uh, I think I've said about uh, a maximum of 12 uh, uh, hits, so to speak. Um, so uh, you've, you've had a good night. Okay, 3AML uh, and uh, all the other folks.
folks out there. This is the case through Carly Sierra Juliet, Mary Warren South, and uh, we'll leave you with that. Yeah, thanks, Clint. VK3CSJ. Um, VK3AML, I don't think there's a group there anymore. Peter's headed off. Uh, what is it? 12.35, 35 minutes past midnight for anybody who's listening from other than the eastern suburbs, the eastern states of Australia. We have eight on the uh, viewing list at the moment. Interestingly, Clint, I, I, I leave the um, recordings of these sessions up and over a three or four week period, they can sometimes get two or three hundred hits. I don't know how many people listen to them for a reasonable amount of time, but um, it seems to be appreciated by somebody, which is probably good. I, I, over the 50 years that I've been involved with ham radio in one way or another, either as a, an avid listener or a pirate in the early days, 60s, or now, um, I've seen the technology improve incredibly, but the usage of it shrink. Um, it would, I really think people are losing, there has been a certain loss of people able to rag chew, which is really why I got involved with the hobby in the first place, to be able to communicate outside the family grouping. Uh, one interesting correlation I frequently find with ham radio operators is that they're frequently only children, often of older parents. My parents were in their mid-40s when they had me and I was the only child. Uh, Tony Sanderson, likewise, um, or in some cases they're the children of a family where they're either the youngest by a large margin or the oldest by a large margin. Um, reasonably intelligent people who want to communicate outside the family circle for whatever reason. So there are certain characteristics in the average radio ham as compared to the general community, which I, I, I think correlate. So that's one of them. And uh, so consequently, my two interests are communication visually, hence my interest in... Um, slow scan TV, digital slow scan particularly, I find analog slow scan a little bit poor in quality for interest. I'm also interested to pursue the possibility of narrow band transmission in a voice band with of uh, at least a basic head and shoulder moving image of a thumbnail type. I believe it can be done on HF and I, I'll be interested to pursue that when I get the SDR, the NAN going. I'm sure that I can do it it's just a matter of finding the right software and applying it the right way. Uh, and I'm interested in high quality audio because uh, I find narrowband audio, 300 hertz to 3K frequently with a lot of distortion, very difficult to bear over a long period, fatiguing, unpleasant. Um, and now that internet is there, I think a lot of people are thinking that uh, if you pay $1,000 plus for a a radio telephone that only gives you telephonic quality. It is a little bit too much of an investment. And ANAN uh, and software-defined transceivers, I think, uh, have the potential of being much better in audio quality. I'll make a final call for anybody who wants to call in. This is VK3AML. Is anybody wanting to join us for a chat? VK3, Alpha Mike Lima, standing by. Somebody very weak there, but not, not enough signal to decode anything. Anyway, um, if anybody would like to have a final, have it now. Otherwise, I'll, I'll do the close down announcement. And thank you for being with us, people. Very much appreciated. We've been on for three hours and 11 minutes. Holy moly. VK3, Alpha Mike Lima, standing by finally. Does anybody want to say anything? No, that looks like it's it. So uh, I'll do the final announcement if I can find my chimes. Here we are. 
and bring the level up and get my headphones on so I can get some monitoring going. You have been listening for the past three hours to VK3AML, the regular Saturday night session. Good night, Steve, and thank you for listening in. Uh, I always feel a little bit tremulous when I see members of the department listening in, but <laughs> I, uh, if, if, if the worst had happened, I'm sure it would have happened by now, Steve. Uh, so you've been listening to... Oh, too loud, too loud. This is VK3 Alpha Mike Lima now closing on uh, 147475 with that very overdone gong. I'll have to get a real one, a dinner chime or something. Um, and we'll be back next Saturday night, 9.30 p.m. with another program related to either science and technology, history of broadcasting, history of recording, that sort of thing. So if that's your bag... Uh, either come up on this YouTube live or uh, via 147.475. And we may, within the month, be up on 37, 3670. Uh, VK3 Alpha Mike Lima now closing on 147.475. And also closing on this. Thank you very much, people, for coming up on the YouTube Live. It's been an interesting experiment. I've finally worked out how to uh, hook in my mixer uh, without going through the Q channel and leaving a, a live microphone all the time, which could be embarrassing. Good night. Have a great remainder of Easter for those of you who are of a religious persuasion to follow that sort of thing. And uh, I hope to see you next Saturday night, 9.30pm Melbourne time, for the next session from here at VK3AML. All the best. <laughs>